being allowing him to come back. Thank you.
tonight because it is such a gorgeous day here in Columbia Beach, Virginia. <laughs> All right, I'm going to call to order the Wednesday, April 5th, 2023 Town Council Work Session at 6 p.m. All right, roll call of members. All members are present. And amendments to the agenda. I would like to make a motion to nix the April 20th minutes. We only have the December 15th minutes on the consent agenda. And then I'm uh, to close session pursuant to Virginia Code 2.237, 11, 8, 3, and A8, which is discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for public purposes. Where discussion and open meeting would adversely affect the town's bargaining position or negotiation strategy and consultation with legal counsel regarding town hall. We're going to add that. We're going to strike the April 20th minutes. Okay. Do I have a second to that motion? Second. All right. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. All right. Approval of the agenda is amended. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do have a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. Okay, great. We're moving right along. It's still pretty outside. All right. The consent agenda. Um, like I mentioned, we have the December 15, 2021 minute. The adoption of the Northern Neck Regional Hazard Mitigation Plan, which is written by the Northern Head Planning District Commission and then all of the districts within that um, commission's territory adopted and a resolution to adopt our planning commission's 2023 work plan. Do I have a motion for that? So moved for a second. Is there any further discussion? Madam the Mayor. Yes. The only addition to that would be is I was not on council on December 15th. Okay, we'll note that. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Ms. Um, so we're actually voting to adopt that plan. It was hundreds of pages when we got it a few days ago. Yeah, so we don't write the plan. It's just like the FEMA thing. It's just a, a practice to adopt all the localities adopt the same plan written by the planning district commission. Okay. And, and then another question. Um, so by voting for the planning commission work plan uh, but there's you know some things on there like establish a marijuana dispensary ordinance is that something council is asking them to do or is it ask them to do or are they just um, come up with things on their own how, how does this work mr dooley can address that we talked about it in the meeting and it's something that had been on the previous one and right now there's um it's it has it's not in the legislation the ability to do that yet. What you want to add to that, Mr. Dooley? Yeah, Mr. Dooley, go ahead. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, the that was added to the council's uh, or excuse me, to the uh, planning commission's uh, work plan, um, and the commission uh, subsequently moved it uh, to 2024 um, to consider um, uh, a medical or a, a marijuana ordinance um, if things progressed within the legislature far enough to allow the planning commission to make a recommendation to the to the town council with regard to whether or not uh, dispensaries uh, should be appropriately regulated or not but at this time since there's um, there's uncertainty in the state law with regard to medical marijuana medical dispensaries or sale of marijuana um, that's been deferred, like I said earlier, to uh, to 2024. So at this time, it's planned to be discussed, but nothing uh, in the immediate future. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Uh, all in favor of the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Council member liaison and commission report. And I will start with Dr. Selfelda. I make that neither one of you. Um, so the planning commission, um, you have uh, an update of their work. They I just want to commend them for all the efforts that they put into this. They've had their regular meetings plus work sessions and, and pulling this work plan together. Um, 
the um, Community Redevelopment and Housing Authority have been meeting regularly. I do believe there is an opening on that. If anybody's interested in, in applying for that, they still have an opening on that. And they continue to work with their consultants to try to find ways to better serve the community. And the uh, uh, zoning, what do you call that? The, the, the appeals? BTA, the, the Board of Zoning Appeals, thank you, um, has not met. India and I had a, a, well, I thought it was a very useful meeting the first of last week with uh, Sheriff Balderson. Uh, CO was very accommodating, and I think, obviously, he's been at it for 16 years, so there are no secrets. <clears throat> as to what's going on at Colonial Beach, but I sensed a very sincere desire on his part to accommodate us to the extent that he could within resources as it has occurred. So I've a very positive meeting on that. Also got a chance to tour the uh, dispatch facility, and, and I'll admit to being something of a technological Luddite, but, but I was very, very impressed. Dispatcher said your six creams displaying everything from maps to messages, and there's a you know, room full of computers that allow access to much information and coordination with a variety of agencies. Uh, the upshot of, of all this is that we still need to negotiate a better deal. <laughs> but but I at least develop some appreciation for the, for the cost associated with a lot of this foolishness. Uh, we, we probably ought to name me the public safety and history liaison. Um, the 250th, the Northern Act 250th Committee is going to break down the subcommittees, and I'm requested to be on the marketing subcommittee. It's my absolute goal that everybody coming down I 95 or 301 will stay, play, and eat at Colonial Beach and then tour the rest of the Northern Act from here. Uh, also, need to point out that uh, we will have again on the 22nd of this month the uh, annual Monroe birthday celebration. Uh, I, I have hoped that my colleague on the far right, or maybe I should say on the far left, depending on how you feel, <laughs> whether you're looking at it from our perspective audience, uh, if, I, if, I, if I have fully enlisted you on that? Yeah, you, you have. I don't have to make it up okay. okay. There's further instructions to follow, but so I'm hoping that the two of us will make a presence for Colonial Beach. That's in addition to Robin being on the agenda again. And I will tell you, Robin, that your speech last year was so well received. You're going to be hard pressed to do better this year. I know. I know. Thank you. It's a really brainstorm on that one. All right, Mr. Allison. <clears throat> okay. Uh, for Parks and Rec, um, the meeting uh, this week was canceled. They're going to have the next meeting on uh, May the second. Um, so, if you would like to attend that, please do so. Um, I know it's kind of public works, but it deals with uh, Parks and Rec. The um, mulch uh, is happening in the parks, so a lot of people have asked about that. So a lot of, a lot of buzz about our parks on uh, social media. So things are happening. Uh, aside from that, we had the Parks and Rec Master Plan, the initial findings presentation. So if anybody attended that, that was very well received. Um, additional timelines for that will be in April, this month will be the organization assessment park <laughs> conceptual planning. Uh, in May, there will be goals, objectives, and recommendations. And finally, in June, we'll have a draft and a final master plan. And as far as finance, we're well into the budget season. Um, it's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, okay, I know it's beautiful, so we're going to go through this again. Uh, Public Works has completed resurfacing the playground materials in the county at Icon and um, the Castlewood Park. Uh, currently working on Washington Park and finishing the Tory Smith. Last week they completed the repainting and striping area of the downtown ahead of parking season, including the new golf cart parking on Madison Avenue ahead of the summer season. Uh, within two weeks, uh, they were going to begin on the next capital improvement project. Uh, the first three uh, as far as the report from um, our nonprofits and uh, fraternal organizations, 
Uh, Colonial Beach churches are going to be having a community wide ecumenical sunrise service on Easter Sunday morning at 6 30 a.m. High Tides, Black Turtle TV Bar. Uh, Pastor Josh Hagstrom from Colonial Beach United Methodist uh, will preside. Uh, in case of bad weather, they're just going to take it inside. Uh, the American Legion Post 148 is going to have its June 3rd annual beer fest hosted by the Auxiliary Club on Town Hill. Uh, Fraternal Order of the Eagles, April 15th. Brown Bag Auction for St. Jude Research Hospital, April 18th. Nomination of officers, April 25th. Uh, nominations for uh, officers for the Auxiliary, April 29th. Fundraiser for St. Jude Research Hospital. And they always collect a lot of money for St. Jude's, so uh, I had to hands up for that. Uh, VFW, April 10, nomination of officers, all positions were open. Uh, April 11, nomination for the officers auxiliary. Uh, the Moose Lodge made their uh, monthly contributions to Moose Art, Moose Art and Moose Haven. Uh, downtown Columbia Beach, the Osprey Festival uh, is going to be uh, co-sponsored by Downtown Colonial Beach and CB Green Space and held on April 15th from 9 to 4. Uh, April 20, uh, 23, Sip and Stroll will be April 14th from 6 to 9 during Second Friday Art Walk. April 15th from 5 to 9 after the Osprey Festival. Uh, Kelly Efko represented Colonial Beach at the National Main Street Conference and downtown Colonial Beach uh, donated $1,000 to support community and heart and soul program. Uh, I was asked to read this in by the Economic Development Committee. Uh, the Firescape American Grill is expected to open in May. Uh, Colonial Beach partnered with King George in Gloucester to gain a Go Virginia grant to help expand opportunities for the Colonial Beach High School students to learn more about entrepreneurship. The grant was announced by Governor uh, Youngkin last week. Colonial Beach was represented at the Virginia Economic Developers Association Springs uh, State Conference. The EDC organized and conducted a scholarship application interview training for 24 juniors at CDH High School uh, in March 29th. Summer job and internship uh, career day was held at the school April 20th to match students with the business community. Man, sorry guys. Uh, the visitor guys are going to the printers uh, for the Colonial Beach Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they donated $1,000 to the Colonial Beach Fire Volunteer Fire Department. Um, the Chamber donated $2,500 the Community Heart and Soul Program to demonstrate the importance of the program to the town to help obtain grants. Uh, the grant application was submitted in March. Uh, the Chamber worked with Bay Aging to ensure that the free trolley rides will continue. Uh, for BAM, uh, April 15th, they'll have a booth at the Osprey Festival for uh, an activities for young people. Uh, April 20th, they will be assisting with the job fair uh, being held during lunchtime at the high school. Uh, they're also helping sponsor various activities during the pre teacher for appreciation week early may uh colonial beach river dogs humane society dog day at colonial beach will be held may 13th 8 30 to 11 on the hill next to dockside and the community colonial beach community foundation the uh welcome to colonial beach meetup will be held cobra backer lead on april 20th the guest speaker will be diane byer director of public works and CBCF has earmarked $20,000 for Colonial Beach nonprofits to promote safety and well being in our community. Applications can be found on the foundation website and are due no later than April 30th. Thank you. Mr. Williams? All right, well, um, Rick took some of my thunder there, but um, as far as economic development, I attended a meeting last night and took several pages notes, so I'm going to go back through those. And give a more thorough report next meeting, but um, just a couple of things that they had concerns about parking. Um, they're really worried about our summer parking, especially as it pertains to the central drainage. Um, so I think one of the things they'd like to see from town government is some kind of a plan, um, schedule, <coughs> something if possible, so that businesses can plan accordingly you know, as far as what streets will be down and any disruptions we're gonna possibly have through the summer. Um, and then they also talked about a couple of things on our agenda. Short-term rentals was one of them. Uh, they definitely seem to uh, agree that we need to do something as far as regulation goes, but they would like time to actually review 
um, some of the details. And I know we're just kind of getting into talking about it tonight, so we'll have some time, I'm sure, for the community to get their feedback on that. And I think that's about it until next week. Sounds good. Ms. Robertson? Um, the schools are in full gear on preparing for the standards of learning tests that come up very shortly. I have not met with the superintendent as they just got their, their, their um, schedules all going after being out for break. Um, later in the week, I'll try and set up my appointment with him, and then they have their meeting next week. Which I, um, I just have a couple updates. First, I want to thank the First Baptist Church for um, the recognition of Women's History Month and the history that was made here in this town um, by electing a female mayor for the first time. Um, I also want to uh, thank the uh, Dahlgren Naval Base and um, Warfare Command. Um, for the invitation to come see the Innovation Challenge and that happened at the Mary Washington campus where uh, Columbia students participated in a robotics challenge and they had to build their robot, move their robot, program their robot to do multiple <coughs> obstacles throughout the event. Um, I was extremely proud of our team from Columbia Beach and this is the first time we've participated. Um, I also finished up the CLC series at the school, which was on local government. Um, the last session was in budgeting, as we are in budget season right now. The <coughs> kids were actually way more interested than you think in the budget, which is great. Um, also, we had an executive comrade session, which is the community engagement around the military installations. And they would like to ensure that, um, and this is kind of who Mr. Wood over here, that <coughs> anybody who wants to invite anybody from the military installations, I already sent a thing up to Tom, who's invited um, Captain Milanarski to the uh, Monroe birthplace celebration, but any of the other um, fraternal organizations or VFW, things like that, that want to invite the base, do that now, and please send the invitations now because they are booking up quickly and they want to make sure they get to as many of the localities as possible, especially during 4th of July when we're building kind of um, and I am just super excited about the Osprey Festival, which is just coming up. It will be before our next meeting. So I just want to say that. Yes. I forgot to mention one thing. Um, I don't know if this will be discussed at future councils or not, but uh, one of the things they mentioned at the Economic Development Committee meeting last night was the Dahlgren testing expansion. Yes, and, and I. I asked the base command to present uh, regarding that issue at our Conroe event. So that will be May 11th when you each host the next group Conroe. It will be at Ice House, Marina, <coughs> but it will be a breakfast item. No mimosas. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so um, we will get some direct information from them. They are lit on lit in litigation for it, so um, they're not going to come to make public comment about anything that's not been advised by their attorneys. Mm -hmm. All right, presentations is our budget presentation. Town manager, Lisa. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mayor, members of council, members of the public. Indy Adams Shakers, town manager, and I'll be using this presentation today with Lisa Oaks, our Director of Finance Customer Service, CFO, as well as Mr. R.T. Taylor and Dr. Bailey, who have been helping us with our long-term financial planning. <coughs> All right. So starting with our summary, uh, we'll do a quick uh, budget overview today with our budget framework, um, a look at our strategic plan, successes, budget process, FY 2014's Town Council Budget Guidelines, have an in-depth look at our state budget, economic outlooks, and financial trends, move on to our budget priorities, budget financials, the proposed budget, FY 23-24 budget, budget timeline, and then next steps. So a little bit about our budget framework. As a reminder, the town has to have a budget. Our state code mandates that localities pass a budget. Uh, our town's budget, we have a line-item budgeting process. There are other sorts of budgets, such as 
program and participatory. Uh, local government is required to provide a balanced budget for town council's review and adoption, and that is a responsibility of the town manager. So I'll be bringing that forward with today. A connection back to our strategic action plan, our organizational mission, and values. Obviously, as a local government, um, specifically the town of Columbia Beach, mission is to provide services and build a better community. This was adopted at our last year's strategic action planning session. Uh, we adopted values as an organization, which include integrity, open and responsive communications, inclusivity, financial responsibility, balance, professionalism, consistency, resiliency, resiliency respect, sustainability, and trust. Uh, these are also aligned with our strategic action plan goal areas, including infrastructure, public safety, livability, placemaking, economic development, and government performance. Taking a look at our January strategic planning retreat, Council provided some budget guidelines as we went into the budget process this year, which was new. Um, so we thank them for that guidance, uh, some of which were to take a look at maximizing the collection rate of current taxes, reviewing fees for service and connection fees to fully cover costs, looking at revenue diversification, um, and reviewing the percentage and timing of appropriations to the school system, considering COLAs uh, for staff, including funding for compensation study, developing strategies for our exit plan for our ARPA funds, and then finally giving us a third rail of not considering real estate tax increases as part of this budget process. <clears throat> Looking at our budget this year, we obviously continue to build on our solid foundation um, with uh, revenues um, equally, equally expenditures, uh, including no transfers from the unsigned fund balance used to balance our budget. Uh, moving forward with our capital improvement plan and can continue to leverage uh, our ARPA funds for infrastructure. This is a slide from our event last year, one of our community engagement events that I thought really encompasses uh, what we look to do as a town, which is provide services to everyone, our approximately 4,000 residents of this great town. Uh, we are one town, we are one team, Team CDBA. Uh, when you think about the, the services that we provide, everything from public safety, um, to maintaining your roads, to your water coming out of your faucet in the morning, to the toilets that you flush, your local government literally impacts your day from the beginning to the end. So thinking about our town services, um, to sum it up, I think I'll take it from Bill, Bill's presentation of last week. When your town government works, everything works. Speaking of our budget process, I'd like to announce something that uh, we received late last year, uh, but want to really give a kudos to our team, which really was a huge lift. Uh, for the first time ever, the town has received a GFOA budget award. We were one of 100 first-time winners in the United States and we received a Distinguished Budget Presentation Award recipient from our last year process. So I'd really like to give our team a <laughs> GFO establishes a Distinguished Budget Presentation Award to encourage and assist state and local governments with their budget documents of the very highest quality that reflect both guidelines established, um, which includes budgeting for transparency, and for these documents must create um, and meet certain program criteria as a policy document, which this council adopted uh, financial policies last year, financial planning, which we are continuing to work on, serve as an operations guide and a communication tool. So we're very proud of this. And I'd definitely like to thank Ms. Lisa Oaks. Last year we had our fellow Nathan Solia, Adam Schaefer, who's part of our budget counterparts team, Nisha, Hope, and Kiera, who have all done so well that they found jobs elsewhere. <laughs> At this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bailey to give us some brief updates on our state budget overview, economic outlooks, and financial trends. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. It's an honor to be back with you again. I'm going to bring you some brief highlights of the, uh, the items mentioned in terms of the state budget, economic outlook, and financial and local financial trends. Next slide, please. So from an economic outlook standpoint, um, I was asked by the Virginia Local Government Managers Association and the State Local Government Finance Network to talk about the economic outlook and what it means for local governments. I'm going to give you a short snapshot tonight and get quickly to the bottom line. We have a slowing economy with mixed results. Um, the inflation is slowing, but is still persistent. It's very, what we call sticky. It is sticky. Um, we have continued tight labor markets and above, above <coughs> the historical trend wage and job growth. 
Um, we have a strong job and wage growth. Um, we have consumers have been the underpinning of our economy. It's, we've had some resiliency there, but that demand is cooling. They're getting some pressures on inflation as well as um, some other aspects. Um, also, we have a slower housing market. We had gangbusters there for a couple of years, but it is slowing and beginning to normalize. Next slide, please. Um, bottom line is um, we have, and, I'm, and so I'm not going to, I'll, I'll leave some of the points on the slides for your review later, and I'm going to hit highlights tonight. Um, so the bottom line is that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty relating to the U.S. economy, and there's increased projections for a mild, shallow recession in 2023 into 2024. Later this year into early 2024, timing, everyone's looking at the timing every week. But that is the increasing um, 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 projection for a shallow mile recession or a slow session, as Moody's calls it. Um, so we're not going to have the same level of growth as projected as we have had the last couple of years. Um, local government impacts, key highlights, um, expectation of continued inflation through fiscal year 2025. So it's going to be with us for a while. We didn't have it for a while, but now it's going to be with us for a while. Although it is slowing, it's still persistent and sticky. Continued upper pressure on wages. Actually, there's now discussion, has the pandemic permanently impacted the labor market? We don't know yet, but those are the kind of things we're, we're now discussing and looking at. And then also, the slowing economy will dampen revenue growth. Those are the things in terms of the key impacts for local governments. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I highlight some <coughs> key takeaways with regard to the state budget. First thing I want to mention is we have a state budget for 2022 to 2024. Um, the biennial two-year budget was approved in June of 2022. The General Assembly session for the 2023 session was considering amendments to our existing two-year budget. So we have a budget. It was the amendments that were being considered at the 2023 session. Um, with regard to the General Assembly, um, did end up choosing to do a skinny budget and to adjourn, officially adjourn, sine die on February 25th. Um, of the four things that were addressed in the skinny budget, budget I'm going to highlight something of particular interest um, to local government, is that there was a whole harmless provision approved for the Virginia Department of Education miscalculation, that era, for fiscal year 23 only, only for the existing fiscal year. The fiscal 24 element of the Department of Education's miscalculation is still out there. That has not been addressed, was not, was not solved in the skinny budget. So fiscal year 24 miscalculation from the Department of Education is still in negotiations between the House and Senate for the remaining budget items that were not agreed upon in this skinny budget. More discussion is taking place on the state budget. Um, the governor recently mentioned that they still have some time on that. Um, the veto session is taking place on um, April 12th, which is required as a result of the official adjournment, sine die, on February 25th. So there's still a lot um, outstanding between the House and Senate in terms of their discussions of the budget amendments they were considering for 23, we have the existing two-year budget, we have the skinny budget, and then we're waiting to see what else is going to happen on the budget. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as a follow-up to the very engaging time that we had with council and retreat, um, we discussed long-term financial trend analysis to support um, the town's Colonial Beach's value of financial responsibility. We want to thank council for that support and those discussions, and as such, um, staff uh, and, and I, we have un undertaken uh, and started that financial trend analysis, which we promised we would do. And I really do want to bring a, a short report to you in that regard. It supports the financial responsibility value, um, but also supports the fiscal year 24 budget. Um, just a quick, quick um, report card on where we are and on that. The, the benefit of this financial trend analysis is already bearing fruit in your fiscal year 24 process. But also, it has longer term impact in terms of it fosters and supports proactive management, which allows us to diminish risk, as well as enhance um, preparedness. 
Uh, also, we can identify our financial strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and challenges. I know people talk about SWAT. I don't like SWAT. I like SWAC. S um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and challenges. And then also, it illuminates some trends that may benefit from additional support or perhaps some um, preventive action. Also, this financial trend analysis helps us augment our strategic opportunities. We get to see them ahead and then seize upon them. It enhances, it helps us enhance in performance, increase our efficiency and effectiveness, identify additional opportunities for innovation, and help us achieve and progress toward those strategic goals. And the council has, and the, and the community has robust strategic goals. We've been making progress, and this will help you in that continued effort. Um, the next slide shows, again, a little bit of a snapshot just to show you that we have been working on the financial trends, key trends identified from fiscal year 17 through fiscal year 22. I'm going to unpack that on the other slide, so don't worry. You have that in your in your file, in your, in your packet, um, part of your presentation, but I'll bring highlights, just some key takeaways. So key, key takeaways from the financial, financial trend analysis, we're going to focus on 19 to 22, when this town um, and, and, and implemented a new financial system. And so we are focusing on 19 to 22 with that new, um, implement, new system in 19. Balanced budgets were achieved um, in fiscal years 19 through 21 with the total revenues exceeding total expenditures after some substantial uh, operating deficits in fiscal years 17 and 18. Total expenditures grew over twice as fast as total revenues during the 2019 through 22 period. So that's a trend that we're identifying. And again, the, this financial trend analysis helps you to act proactively in that regard. Real estate collections, also the percentage of real estate collections um, were consistently average 94 and a half percent at the end of the fiscal year in fiscal years 19 through 22. And Current year real estate revenue comprised 47% of total revenues in the general fund um, on average in fiscal years 19 through 22. Also, we can see the evidence, as we can see almost in every local government budget, the evidence of this pandemic roller coaster that we have been on and we're still coming out of. Um, you know, whenever you go up and down, up and down. So we're still looking to get out of that. Um, that, that, that roller coaster that we've been on since 2020. Um, so in 2021, it shows some of that roller coaster. So the fiscal year 21, the budget was being prepared in spring of 2020, in the midst of the pandemic recession, when we were dropping fast and deep. Uh, and so all local governments during that period instituted significant cuts because there was broad uncertainty about what, we were, you know, what in the world was happening to us. So all local governments instituted those cuts because they remembered the great financial crisis. Come to find out, a, a novel pandemic recession is a little bit different, but we didn't know that at the time. Ultimately, by the end of the fiscal year, which was over almost a year and a half later, so certainly by June 30th of 2021, well over a year later, by that time, uh, increased federal and state aid ultimately had been received. So that impacted the year-end results. Um, and with also with various spending requirements, all that state aid and, and federal aid came with the various spending assignment, uh, um, requirements. So when we look at the fiscal year-end, because the financial statements are the point in time, the last day, the last hour on June 30th. So when we look at June 30th of 2021, and the fiscal year statements for, 20, for that fiscal year, we see that it was impacted by the, co um, the, um, the cost cuts, the increased federal and state aid, but also higher personal property really happened because the used cars call prices spiked between 20 and 21. That showed up in the fiscal year 21 statement. Also, we had increased meals um, and parking revenues from the increased day trippers because folks decided that outdoors was great and Colonial Beach was right there for them. And so also inflation was beginning to show up then, we can see that. So that's 
it, those, all those were the big factors that impacted the end of fiscal year 21 results. On the next slide, we move on to fiscal year 22. In fiscal year 22, substantial um, changes, um, budgetary changes occurred. Um, and that budget was, to, now the, again, we're developing these budgets the spring before, we, and we look at the financial statements almost a year and a half later. So the fiscal year 22 budget was developed under the previous interim town manager and inherited by the current town manager. That's not unlike so, like when the governor changes off to that happens too. Anyway, but at least the new governor gets to make amendments. Um, but so we had a change there. And so when we look at the end of the fiscal year, um, the following year, after the budget had been developed in the spring of 21, um, we see that expenditures, total expenditures in the FY22 budget grew 32.8%. While the revenues, total revenues, and this is all general fund, the total general fund revenues grew by 4.6% that year. And so, so then we say, okay, what happened? So we looked at some very key increased expenditure drivers, and that's not unhealthy revenue growth, it's just that it was, over, it was the, the expenditures grew faster. Um, so increased um, expenditure drivers were schools transfer, Staffing costs for essential services, that's seen all across the audit in terms of audit results. Um, fuel, we know what happened to the price of gas. Uh, and also maintenance and repair <coughs> expenses. That show up as the big ticket items, those, those expenditure drivers in fiscal year 22. When we look at the end of fiscal year 22 revenues, we see that the key increased revenue drivers were personal property taxes again, so again, the, 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 the fiscal year starts in June, July 1st of 21, and it goes to June 30th of 22. Used car prices were still going up, spiking through January of 2022. They've come down drastically since then, but some of that used car price spike, you show up in your personal property taxes in fiscal year 22. Another revenue driver, increased revenue driver, was meal taxes and parking fees related to those, um, you know, the increased state trip tourism, and also grants. Grants show up as a, uh, uh, as a noticeable factor in terms of increased revenue in fiscal year 22. All in, at the end of the fiscal year, on June 30th, um, an operating deficit was uh, getting reported after those in 17 and 18. Uh, a smaller one, much smaller one, was recorded in fiscal year 22 of minus $226,000 operationally in terms of total expenditures exceeding total revenues and other financing sources. So where's, where are we in some recommendations as a result of this? For fiscal year 23 and beyond, um, one takeaway is consistently balanced budget. Our step one, for building that solid foundation um, to achieve mission and to advance and progress on strategic goals. Second recommendation observation, and did take a look at this, the fiscal year 23 budget um, was developed in spring 22, again last year this time, and that budget recognized the gaps that had materialized in fiscal year 22. So although um, you didn't have all of the results last spring, the budget that was adopted, it's evident, you can see evidence that the gaps that had materialized in fiscal year 22 um, were recognized, those operational gaps were recognized in the 23 budget. So the total revenues are planned to exceed total expenditures in fiscal year 22 in the general fund. Recommendation, closely continue to closely monitor the fiscal year 23 budget, especially given the uneven timing of revenues and expenditures in local government. So I like to say you have to pay salaries and keep the lights on every day, but the revenues come, the major revenues come very uneven. So as of March 22 of 2023, um, staff and I looked at that, staff did an analysis of this, that was 72% of the fiscal year. You, at March 22, you had achieved almost exactly 72% of the fiscal year. At that point, total General fund revenues were at 58% and total general fund expenditures were at 
That just shows the uneven time. The expenditures have been fairly even, but the revenues are very uneven and local government. And um, so that, <coughs> that shows up there. Uh, the second real estate billing that's due June 5th, just 25 days before the end of the fiscal year, is critical. Given the significant importance of current real estate revenues to the town budget. And I just want to note that 94.5% was the average, with the December billing having a higher percentage collected by fiscal year end than the June 5th billing. June 5th is only 25 days before the end of the fiscal year. So closely monitoring that will be important. Also, the recommendation, which I can say that I can see evidence that certainly has been fulfilled, that carefully developed the fiscal year 24 budget, a balanced budget based on the financial trends that have been identified for fiscal year 19 and 2022. I can say that during the course of the analysis, we've got a lot done in about a couple of months since we saw you, that um, we were last with you. Um, staff, every time we meet again, it's very obvious that staff has been incorporating whatever finding we find along the way in this financial trend analysis, they have been incorporating that into the 24 budget. So uh, they've been, and, you know, it's only a few days, they said we've done this, we've done that. So there has been a significant effort on staff to incorporate these findings that we have found in the financial trends into the 24 budget that is, has been developed. Also, the final recommendation is, as at this point, is after the 24 budget adoption um, to develop a long-term financial plan which incorporates all funds and all future obligations and contracts and needs for three to five years is recommended to address the growing cost and expenditure pressures that are, affecting, uh, that are evident and affecting all local governments uh, and future capital needs. And that long-term financial plan will also build, help build financial sustainability and financial resiliency in keeping with the values of um, financial responsibility of the town. With that, that concludes um, my um, short presentation. I want to commend, highly commend the council and the staff for undertaking this type of financial analysis for fiscal year, heading into fiscal year 24. Thank um, you. All local governments will have to do this for 25 to 26 as we um, come out of the pandemic um, roller coaster, but um, Okay, we're just taking care of you. We'll keep going. We're trying to get out of here before the sun sets. Well, well, okay. I just wanted to say thank you so much and commend all your efforts and your guidance. Thank, thank, sure. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jump into some of the priorities for this fiscal year. Um, we've obviously discussed recruitment and retention um, last year as well as this year. Um, and identifying that, um, obviously just wanted to show this um, slide from ICMA on how employers can improve the workplace, which include improving salaries, <coughs> offering increasing services, and ensuring more appreciation and recognition for the employees and the work that they do. This is something that we've been working on in lockstep with all of our departments, as well as human resources to ensure that we can do that for our um, organization and ensure that our workplace is um, continues to grow and build as we move forward. Next slide. As a result of that planning and our recruitment and retention strategy this year, we are proposing a COLA increase of 3%, uh, also recommending a staff retention incentive as we did last year, leveraging some of our ARPA funding. Uh, we had about 20 positions that we looking to bring up to the $15 minimum wage, which is an upcoming uh, state mandate that will be coming down the pipeline as well as adjusting our health care plans to save the town, as well as our employees longer. One of the other um, key initiatives we're looking to continue on is um, improving our, and actually undertaking our comp comp compensation study, as well as moving forward with our community survey, uh, leveraging one-time funding in our HR for the compensation study. Um, about three years ago, town undertook the study for the police department only. Uh, this year, we'd be looking at doing the entire organization, and the community survey is something that we've discussed uh, for almost two years now, um, finding a way to include both mailing and online options so that we can really reach out to all of our residents, engage how we're doing as a locality. Next slide. 
health insurance updates. Um, probably one of the best takeaways from our budget process this year after listening to the council and, and, and many of our staff about the burden that the health care costs were um, on our employees. We were able to maintain uh, a no-cost insurance plan for those who are on our single plans. We've also revised plan options, which is projected to save an estimated $100,000 this budget cycle. Um, and we've provided uh, new plan options, which will include an average employee savings of about $250 per month for an employee and a spouse. And then most importantly for those family plans um, that were really burdening some of our staff, uh, we have restructured our plan, which will allow for average employee savings of $500 per month, which will estimate to be a savings of about $6,000 over, over a year. So that's really uh, kudos to um, our HR team, our consultant, as well as helping us with that. Um, and that was a priority that we had going into our budget process this year. As we've seen many other localities still experiencing increases um, in this area, um, we're actually working on reducing. Moving on, I'll pass it over to Lisa. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, this slide here is uh, from the uh, budget that was given to you from the school board. Um, they were match. Um, that they had presented to you was two million six fifty five nine twenty. Um, they also have in their budget seven point two million dollars invested in their employee pay and benefits, and a seven percent average employee pay increase. Next slide. Okay, the schools have requested um, two million six fifty five nine twenty for fiscal twenty two. Um, this is including three positions, one for an assistant uh, principal for the elementary school, as I said before, a 7% increase for staff. Um, the, the request actually is for 2743366 and that includes the assistant principal. Um, they prepare their budget on an ADM of 555 at 2655920. Um, the Virginia Department of Education update shows an ADM now 562 with the required local match of $2,560,258. That's a difference of $183,108 from what they are requesting. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, slot, a snapshot of the COLA uh, that has been given between the town employees and school employees over the last uh, three budget cycles. As you can see in fiscal 22, uh, town got 1% and the school got 5%. In 23, it was 2% and they got 6%. And now this year, they're proposing a 7% increase and we are only able to provide 3% for our town staff. Next slide, thank you. Uh, some public safety increases that we've experienced in this budget. E911 is going up about $18,000. For dispatch services, there's been a 15% increase in the rent of the PD's facility at the tune of $9,000. And we also increased um, the donation to the fire department uh, for $5,000 for fiscal year 23. Back to you. To touch on some budget impacts, other budget impacts to the general fund, um, we um, are budgeting an increase in attorney, in attorney fees. Um, last year, we happened to have a joint position with the Department of Community Development and Zoning, as well as an in-house attorney, which saved us over time. Uh, we now have those positions split um, with uh, Missy's departure, so we are um, increasing um, that line item based on the trends that we've seen thus far. Uh, we are also budgeting for additional building maintenance for deferred deferred maintenance on town on facilities, as well as gas, petroleum, construction, and materials increase as we continue to see those pressures from um, inflation, as well as upcoming state mandates that we mentioned earlier. So for the proposed budget, um, obviously it's again built on conservative <coughs> estimates with a focus on core services, as we mentioned, in line with our financial planning. Um, as a statutory requirement, town council must adopt the final budget for FY22 or FY24 um, by June 30th. Um, the proposed budget totals uh, 
$17,855.82, uh, with an increase of $437,026.67 um, compared to last year's budget. This also includes uh, maintaining a 78 cent flat tax rate based on the guidance provided by town council at the annual strategic plan retreat. The next slide is an overview of our tax rate slides um, with no changes, as we mentioned. Next slide. Um, some general takeaways from the general fund, some of the things we mentioned, obviously, legal fees. Um, in order to realize some of those savings in the health plan, um, we have to administer a new program, which, re which requires some upfront costs, um, but projected to have savings over time. We discussed the dispatch service personnel costs, increase in the rent, as well as audit services. Some actions taken to balance this budget. Um, we had two vacant positions um, in our police department for patrol officers that have been removed um, in lieu of adding one additional part-time officer, um, as we believe that's a strategy that we can actually um, obtain and recruit and retain those officers um, in the part-time position. Historically, the town has had about four part-time patrol officers to be able to uh, increase service delivery during our peak season, and that's a strategy that we're looking at moving back towards to. Um, we also have frozen the GIS analyst position, uh, working through a contract for this fiscal year, and we froze a part-time position, decreased contracts for professional services in various departments, and made those uh, much-needed adjustments to our health insurance plans. Now I'll turn it back to Lisa. Uh, here is a chart for the uh, 24 budget showing our revenues. As you can see, uh, real estate taxes comprise this year uh, for fiscal 24, 51.65% of our annual revenues. Um, and as you can see, the next one would be intergovernmental and mostly that is state money that we get every year. Um, next slide is your expenditures. Um, as you can see, our biggest expenditure <coughs> is still our school, uh, followed by public works and the police. And the water and sewer funds. Um, water revenue um, comes from three sources, our charges, our connection fees, and reconnection fees for when we shut off people's water for non-payment. And we go into the expenditures. Uh, we can see we have our operating expenses of um, $901,000 and our debt service is $418,000. Going on to sewer, um, we have a little bit more uh, revenue coming in on sewer. You've got your sewer charges. We've got our septic receiving that we started doing a few years ago. Um, connection fees for sewer. And then we get uh, money from the county for the wastewater processing fees and for um, the upgrade to the uh, treatment plant. And we go on to the expenditures. Um, you have your sewer department is 650,000. A wastewater treatment plan, uh, expenditures of 1.5 million, and then our debt service is almost $400,000. Back to India. So some key takeaways um, in both the water and sewer, uh, we've seen some chemicals increase. We've also had um, increased some medical and lab supplies in our plants to ensure that they um, maintain um, their level of services and are also safe. Uh, replacement um, equipment, again, equipment that has been deferred maintenance for several years. Um, seen some increase for contracts for professional services. We are switching our labs. Um, we also see, obviously, an increase in asphalt and concrete in our sewer supplies rental equipment, as well as repairs and maintenance. <clears throat> so moving on to some capital highlights, we touched on our CIP, um, both at the Planning Commission um, in the last several months, as well as with um, Mr. RT in our last meeting. We know um, that our central drainage area project is um, going to be starting very soon. Uh, we've talked about some of the other um, improvements in our parks. We also have a water line replacement that's set to start in about two or three weeks on the water line replacement. Um, and then looking ahead in 2024, 2028, um, we have uh, many projects that will be coming down the pipeline. Um, we know the Northside Park, um, also maybe known as Pilot Cove Park at this point, is, is estimated to be at about 225,000. Um, uh, rough estimates initially from our parks consultants, and then we will be um, discussing the town hall HVAC replacement this afternoon. Um, um, as well as some other projects um, moving forward. So I will turn it over to RT just to wrap up on the CIP briefly. Um, and before he turns it right back over to you. Good evening. Thank you for having me back. Um, just real quickly, one of the things I think you've 
probably heard a couple times now is that the FY 2024 budget um, is is balanced um, operationally. Um, we've got recurring revenues covering recurring expenses. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we wanted to do is hit pause on the CIP development for the long range plan that to follow the adoption of the FY 24 budget um, because it makes sense to us that with us running our own skinny budget, if you will, to balance for FY24, um, we wanted to make sure that, number one, you have a solid adopted budget for FY24 without contemplating any real estate tax increases, et cetera. Um, but one of the things we want to make sure we visit and follow up quickly, once you adopt one budget, the next budget season really starts. Um, so that will be a part of what we do over the coming months with the long range planning. Um, you know, you've got significant CIP needs in the future. Um, and some of those will take care of, uh, call it um, challenging situations, whether it's infrastructure or what have you. So one of the things we just wanted to give you some food for thought on as we get through the adoption of the FY24 budget and thinking ahead of where we could get more movement on our long range CIP um, and, and backtracking a little bit. The FY23 budget, as Dr. Bailey pointed out, took <coughs> care of some of that um, where the budget was running thin and we actually had a deficit in FY22. The pennies, when we hit equalization, that would have been 71 pennies. Your current rate, as you know, in the 23 budget was 78 pennies. That's what your current rate is for 23 and will be for 24. So we've effectively raised seven pennies on the real estate tax rate last year to deal with most of that imbalance. Um, so one thing as you're thinking through the next budget cycle, um, we wanted to provide you a quick, um, quick reference sheet to say, okay, again, just tying it back to real estate dollars, you can get to the same place through other sources. Um, the, the town's budget, currently is based off of real estate property for 23 um, of 608 million there on line two under the first column estimated FY 23 days. And if you are looking through this and thinking, okay, well, what, how can we generate revenue sources to afford our projects? Um, Cause anything you add into it over and above what you currently have budgeted for 24 is going to be a potential impact. So if I raised one penny on the real estate tax base for um, 23, as you can see there, that's equivalent of $60,000. Um, and if you raise two pennies, it's 121 and so forth down the line, just to give you an order of magnitude and range. And as you work across the sheet, just with a, a call it a historical average being 1% um, for the town's tax base, you can see how those pennies grow over time. If you'll flip to the, I think it's the next slide. The question becomes, how does this impact the taxpayers? Um, you know, you, you hear anytime that a governmental body <coughs> brings up the, the idea or concept that of raising taxes, everybody takes a step back. Um, but one of the things we realize is that if we live and, and work and, and this is where our community is and we enjoy the services provided by the town, you know, if the town is talking about raising any pennies or sources for CIP projects, what is that going to mean to us? So we did another quick reference chart here for a house ranging from $100,000 up to $300,000 for these purposes. And for example, under the first column, assuming 100,000, just to make the numbers easy, at your current real estate tax rate of 78 cents, that creates an annual tax bill of 708 bucks. Um, what's the incremental impact for every penny you charge me over and above that? That's going to be $10 a year. So that's 83 cents a month. So that's how that works down from lines nine down through 18 to give you a range between one penny impact to the, a resident with a hundred thousand dollar house. If you flip to the right hand side of the page on the higher end of $300,000, um, the annual tax bill is um, if you add another penny to that house, um, that'd be $30 a year or roughly $2.50 a month. So this is, again, just to give you a, a quick cheat sheet, if you will, as you're 
looking forward um, to the next next budget cycle. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Thank you. As we wrap up, we'll talk about our budget recommendation, the budget timeline. We are at April 5th uh, with the budget presentation to town council. Um, the public hearing, which we will be looking to set, will be on April 19th with a budget adoption um, slated for May 17th. Next slide. So um, here is the takeaway slide for our recommendation. Again, flat 78 cents based on town council's budget guidance of no additional real estate taxes um, given at the annual strategic planning retreat. Um, we are recommending the um, ADM or the CBPS funding based on the state required local match um, on the Cal 2 based on um, the most recent from EDOE um, at ADM of I-62 um, with semi appropriations to uh, CBPS in June and January, um, and then proceed to a uh, public hearing on April 19th with the final adoption um, on May 17th for our budget. So that concludes um, the presentation, and I'll let you any questions that you have. Okay, any questions? Um, the line item budget is available to the public at this point is recommended or no? It will be posted under the presentation um, items and the clerk posts them to the town website after this meeting. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay. Yes, Mr. Williams. Um, will these presentations also be made available to the public? Yes, all presentations are always made available after the meeting on our town's website. Um, Heather, you want to show people where that might be? Because I get that question a lot. So she's looking for that. Um, last year, the budget was on the finance page. You said it would be under presentations. Will it be under presentations or finance page? So it'll be under the additional meeting items after it is adopted. It'll be in multiple places under finance and budget and ultimately under additional meeting items as well. Okay, thank you. I just want to say there's a lot to absorb, so I don't have a crazy amount of questions right now. but. <laughs> I definitely want to go through this a little bit more thoroughly. I'm still waiting for a copy, but I'll definitely ask some questions at the next meeting. The CFO provided electronic copies today, and we provided copies to um, all council has copies at this point. Thank you. And, and we met together with the town manager and got the line items. So, yeah, we have that also. But it is a lot more to go through. Um, all right, next up, public comment. I only received one from email from Mr. Kelly. So, okay. Do that last if you want. Sounds so, good. First, we have Joni Miller. Hello, my name is Jenny Milward. I live at 405 Livingston Street, Colony Beach, Virginia. Town Mayor and Council Members. You probably can't imagine why I'm here and what I want to talk about tonight. Or maybe you can. Um, we're about 10 days out from our Osprey Festival, the fifth annual uh, Osprey Festival here in Colonial Beach. Um, we're very excited about our presentation that we're gonna to give to you on that day and all the fun activities. Um, I want to invite each one of you to attend. You're guaranteed a good time. Um, it's it's gonna be an amazing thing. Um, our committee's been working about 10 months on this festival and we've really tried to grow it and uh, bring a great festival to our residents, our children, uh, our businesses and the visitors that will come here to visit that festival. And there's gonna be something for everyone, regardless of your age. Um, this year, as was last year, we have speakers scheduled throughout the day, trolley nest tours, golf cart nest tours, um, and we have over 50 exhibitors, which include vendors, um, 
exhibitors and food trucks. That's doubled from last year. So Town Hill's going to be pretty full this year. So I'm excited about that. Um, our keynote speaker is Dr. Brian Watts. He's the director of the Center for Conservation Biology, the College of William & Mary. He's our, and our premier exhibitor is the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And they're gonna have some great things and for kids. And um, it, I'm, I'm excited about those two things as well as everybody else that's gonna be coming. So this is the first big event of the season. Um, our weekend begins with the Art Walk on Friday. We are all aware of that. And then we're gonna have a sip and stroll that night, that Friday night. Um, then of course, festival on Saturday. Uh, Saturday night after the festival, CB Brewing will have the Grand Ole Osprey as they did last year. And there will be another sip and stroll. So that's, that's fun. Um, on Sunday, and this is new for us this year, uh, the Northern Audubon Society and the Northern Master Naturalists they're going to be leading bird walks at uh, James Monroe Birthplace and at Westmoreland State Park. So we'll have signups for that. We already have people signed up. So that's something to do. Then later on in Sunday afternoon, uh, Parks and Rec, Columbia Beach Parks and Rec, is going to have a kite flying, Osprey kite flying day. So it's a full weekend. And um, I hope our, our different businesses will benefit from that on the shoulder season. Um, I know we have visitors already coming in from out of town and out of state to, to come to the festival. So I think it's be good for everybody. Um, and we appreciate the support shown by our community. I especially want to uh, thank our co-hosts, which is downtown Cloning Beach and Cloning Beach Green Space for their support. I um, want to thank the town staff for their assistance. When I have questions and I need help and I'm not sure what to do, they're always right there for me and with me, and I appreciate that. Um, last but not least, a huge shout out to our volunteers. Without them, we couldn't put on this festival. And last count I heard, we have 60 plus volunteers helping to run this festival, and I think that's amazing and good for them. So, um, Remember April 15th, 2023, 94 on Town Hill. I say be there or be square. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Next is Mr. Nigel Long. <clears throat> Nigel Long, 115 Lynn Haven Court, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Um, I primarily wanted to. Uh, commend the work the town clerk has done in putting forward to you uh, ideas for review of the senior and disabled discounts. Um, I think it's the things I, I'm sure you've all read it, but I'm, the things I draw your attention to is the fact that since this was last reviewed in 2014, Social Security has gone up, benefits for people has gone up by 25.8%. Um, and I think that would be a useful percentage to keep in mind. Uh, when you consider what the um, grant should be to these people, the current uh, 600 and 200, what the income limits should be um, for the people, and also what the saving, not mentioned in here, but there is also a maximum savings amount that uh, potential uh, participants have to demonstrate. I think you should look at reviewing all those numbers um, if you choose to consider this. Um, and one reason for doing that is perhaps that only, according to the numbers here, less than one and a half percent of the uh, members of the town of Colonial Beach are, are participating in this program. Um, and that really surprises me um, from what I see in town that uh, only that many people are eligible. Maybe it's publicity and not knowing about it, or maybe it's the limits are just too low for what things uh, currently cost. Um, and my final point on this is uh, you may also want to consider whether the trash fee should be also, also there should be perhaps the same, uh, what is it, 15, 20% um, rebate available to that, to these, uh, these people um, as well. Um, moving on to the trash fund, I was a little surprised in the presentations uh, we heard just now that there was no mention of the trash fund and where that fits into the annual budget, whereas there was a mention of the water and the sewer fund. Um, that Hopefully that trash fund has increased the funds available, the general fund available by that, I don't know, 168,000 or whatever it was, that was 
currently being spent by public works on that. Um, and so I would hope you will be considering that as you come to review the annual budget, even though it wasn't in this presentation. Um, and it, it sort of also made me wonder um, a little bit about one of the sections, which I'm sure <coughs> we'll be hearing about soon, about using ARPA funds to pay for the totas. Um, that surprised me on face value without having heard the presentation, so I apologize if I'm speaking out of turn. But given that the, uh, the amount that you've chosen to charge for that, the, the what is it, third of a million dollars you're going to bring in uh, in your trash fund, was intended, I thought, to include the cost of the totas. Maybe this is just a balancing of funds, and when you bought the totas, the, those ARPA funds will be able to be used for something else within the community because you will be funding that purchase out of uh, what we'll all be paying in our trash and sewer fees. Um, and finally, I was delighted to hear that this will be posted. Um, I'd, I'd also still be interested to see the Davenport report when that's available. Thank you all. I think a lot of your questions will be answered in the upcoming presentation. I apologize. It's okay. Next is Ms. Lori Gore. Madam Mayor, members of Council, Lori Gore, 1344 Street. Tonight I'm speaking on, on behalf of the Economic Development Committee. Thank you, Council Member Williams, for the notes that you take and the details that you report back. It's much appreciated. I'm just doing a wrap up. The short term um, rental program, uh, the Economic Development Development Committee would like to be a part of a working group or to be able to be a part of, you know, the plan for this for a plan that fits Colonial Beach, not necessarily Essex County. And then also the next major concern, which Council Member Williams um, discussed, was the central drainage rollout. And, you know, do we have a date when we'll have, you know, a start date and the street by street that's going to impact for the, the businesses can plan for the economic um, part you know, burn that's going to cause for them. So thank you very much. Next is Mr. Eric Nelson. <coughs> Eric Nelson, 1321 Lawson Avenue. Madam Mayor, Council, thank you for letting me speak this evening. I also want to speak a little bit about the short-term rental proposal. Um, as someone who has a few uh, rentals, short-term rentals, and some of them are actually turning into longer or short-term rentals. But in any event, um, as someone who focuses on real estate in general, I am, uh, I think it's a good idea, a very good idea to take an inventory of the short-term rentals of town. I really have no idea how many there are. Um, I don't know if all of them are paying their uh, business license fees. I sort of suspect that's not the case, but, um, but I think taking an inventory of them all and keeping track of them is, um, is a really good idea, and I would support that. Um, as far as the registration fee, I also support that. I think the idea of keeping track of them and monitoring them and so forth has got to cost some sense of time, so I would support um, a registration free fee. The thing I'm kind of curious about is how the registration fee would relate to the business license fee. I don't know if both of them would be applied or whether that's a subject still to be determined, um, but that seems like something that could be discussed. Um, and. The other thing that I would like to say is that um, my husband and I have taken distressed properties and turned them into rental properties. So we have taken out of inventory some really horrible looking houses and we've turned them into something beautiful and spent a great deal of money and energy and time doing that. So I would hope that there would be some sort of, I don't know, recognition or financial incentive or something like that that, that takes that into consideration that there's some sort of benefit to taking old houses and turning them into something beautiful. Thank you very much. Ms. Jeanette Holman. Hi, good evening everyone. Jeanette Holman, 216 Monroe Bay Avenue, the Sundance condominiums. Um, I'm, I'm happy about the uh, that enterprise fund that's been, been established or will be established to start this to, and um, my question to council or to public works or whoever is at the Sundance condominiums, we don't have room for eight toters for eight units. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not, I have no complaint with the 
ten dollars a month. That's cheap. Um, out in the county is thirty dollars a month. Um, but has any decision been made about condominiums? We'll let you guys follow up after the meeting. At the present okay. Meeting. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> All right. And that's it for people in person. Can I read Mr. Kelly? Yep. Can I read Mr. Kelly? Um, I received an email from Mr. Kelly for public comment. He says, Dear Mayor, <coughs> Council members, as the town considers a new town hall, Council has a fiduciary responsibility to fully investigate and evaluate renovation of the existing town hall. The Douglas Avenue property is a 7,000 square feet office building that is repurposed classroom building. We all agree that the current building's classroom layout is inefficient for office use. Council should consider developing a smart detailed space plan for the existing 7,000 square foot building. The space plan should incorporate all the program needs to efficiently administer the town's business. Special consideration should be given to new technologies and new remote, remote working arrangements that we see today across America. Many companies are reducing their space needs because of remote working arrangements. Once a space plan is completed, completed a renovation budget can be established for council to evaluate. In summary, please get an accurate cost to renovate the existing building before considering construction of a new $15 million or up town hall building. Thank you, Joe Kelly. Thank okay, you, well. Madam Mayor, I think we may have inadvertently missed um, setting um, the public hearing for the next meeting, so I think we have to have a motion to have that on the 19th for the budget. I'm sorry, I don't have anything on my agenda for setting the public hearing. Yeah, so we'll, we need to, I think, entertain a motion for that. I'm sorry if that was missed. Maybe we should close public comment first. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay, is there anybody else? Okay, we'll close public comment. Um, we need a motion to have the public hearing on the next, the next town council. I mean, we're not approving the budget till May, though, right? Right. There was a time. Okay. All right, so is there a motion to hold a public hearing in the next meeting? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Well, I'm going to that. Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right. Um, moving forward, approval of Sunset Code deed. Mr. Callas, I think this is just um, absorbing the subdivision into the town's record keeping and including the road and the water and sewer easements. Correct. This was almost before we the last meeting. The last minute uh, staff noticed that there wasn't a water utility easement that needed to be put in there. That's since been put in there and vetted by everyone who was on that list. Uh, there's just one typo on the draft that council sent that I would correct. It's just a sign and a period that's misplaced after instrument number. But other than that, we have vetted the language for substance and as to form. I would recommend adoption. Okay. Do I have a motion to approve the Sunset Code deed? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Do I have a second? Do just to just to clarify what this means, Sunset Cove, where that was developed, was a single piece of property, and they had to submit a subdivision uh, and get that approved. And now they've done that subdivision, so those individual lots need to be incorporated in the town so that we take over the roads and the water and sewer lines, correct? Correct. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. ARPA fund transfer for trash dirt purchase. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Um, I would like to bring your attention to the memo in your packet that asks for um, startup money to purchase toters for the newly approved trash toter program. Uh, we are asking for $195,000 to be used from the ARPA funds and to that for that funding to be moved to the uh, Public Works Operation Refuse account so that we can uh, make that initial purchase. 
Okay, I have some questions. Um, we're not going to put on this tonight at the work session because there's some discussion uh, on it, but um, there was discussion initially about having two different sizes or one size or two sizes. And I think I, I received feedback from the townhouse um, at no point um, that either the corral system or the smaller toter would be more appropriate there. So just to make sure we're being flexible in that. The 195,000, I've been in touch with the toter uh, manufacturer, and I do want to bring um, bring to light as well that we had a, a question from a citizen regarding another brand of uh, container. Um, I did contact that container representative. Um, the, the, the containers were similarly priced, very, very similarly priced. Um, the toter gave us a better guarantee. They get, they're giving us a 12-year body guarantee on the toter containers. And toter is also signed, they're, they're also um, committed to sustainability. They're not using 100% virgin plastic um, or polypropylene on the, uh, as the other uh, manufacturer is. So toter is committing to a sustainability um, program where they're using up to 33% of recovered plastics in their products. So I thought that was kind of an important thing to go forward. Um, but based on that, uh, to the total of the 195,000 will get us 3,000 um, of the 96 gallon toters to begin the program. And we're also ordering 100 of the 64 gallons. So we'll be able to distribute those at the beginning of the program throughout, um, depending on, on who needs those. We were looking at our special needs list. Um, we were thinking that some of that special needs list might need the 64 gallon. And then we were thinking also about some of the multi-use that may or may not need that. Once we get the program rolling and the proceeds are coming in, um, hopefully we can buy more of those 64 gallon toters once we see who needs them and who might, you know, where we might need more of those. Okay, and just to clarify, because there's a citizen comment about one of the condos, you will be working directly with the condo association and then that would be built as a business account for one corral that, that's a, yes, that is one way that they can go. Um, we have been talking with one multi-use uh, uh, area in the town, and that is how they're wanting to proceed. Sure. So we will work with them individually and whatever works best for each multi-unit um, space, we will we will try to make that work. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and the, I have one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when we're setting up this, as we're setting up this enterprise fund, I know right now it's still in the general budget as we are kind of moving through this process. Um, the concept into another citizen comment, I think was just getting ahead of this presentation, is just um, that that will be reimbursed from the program back to like this ARPA fund. And maybe the town manager can explain the ARPA fund because we're using the term ARPA fund. However, it does not, no longer comes with that same set of regulation. We're just trying to explain where the money had come from originally, right? Town manager, you want to better uh, correct that? Yes, um, the federal government essentially um, gave looser guidelines for small localities and really all localities as this process moved forward over the last few years. Um, but public safety um, was really one of the initial uses of, of ARPA. So even under the old regulations, having our trash in a consolidated area so that our people aren't picking it up because we don't know what could happen in terms of um, a public epidemic or pandemic in the future, I think would apply. But those regulations have been um, lax a bit. Um, so that makes these uh, funds eligible for this process. But now it's sort of like a capital fund, even though it's not a CIP fund, the concept of the program was that the user fees would reimburse this initial cost. Yes, so obviously we are still working through, obviously making sure we um, establish um, that enterprise fund, but in over the, I think the year or two as this um, rolls out, then we'll be able to begin to reimburse um, that fund back with these, from these costs and these fees. That makes sense. Okay. I saw Mr. Wood first, so I'm gonna go to the Actually, you're using your psychic power. Okay, we're right on the same page. Yes, Dr. Sutton. 
So I, I just like um, a little bit of clarification regarding any condo or other unit that wants to do a corral instead. They need to contact you. The, their homeowners association should contact you to set that up. You're not going to reach out. You don't know who wants it and who doesn't want it, right? That is correct. I, I have been um, contacted by several, and we are working with them. I would say that when they when that account is set up, they would need to speak with finance as well and let finance know if they'd like to do a commercial account for all residents or if all residents want to do individual accounts. Um, if they do want to do a commercial account, we can work with them on how many toters that is and where they may be able to put them and planning may have to get involved um, on designing. You know, I think that's pretty minimal. I think we can make that roll pretty pretty smoothly, but there are several of us that could be contacted to get them started, and we're all working pretty pretty tightly together to make this happen. Okay, but an, an initial, like, for example, a Sunset Cove, it doesn't sound like they have done anything yet based on that residence. Sunset um, Cove is single-family home. Not Sunset Cove. Yeah, they, they have, I have Sun, not. Sundance. 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 Yeah. I have not been contacted by them, but. I'm so Mary HOA should contact you. Yes, she can contact me. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Yeah, uh, I think one, during one of the presentations, it was mentioned that people, if they have had existing cans, the town would blow on. Is that still part of the plan? It is. Um, we have, uh, we had to order a stencil. The stencil is here, and hopefully, um, all of my team this week has been on the parks. Um, so hopefully, next week or the week after, we'll be able to go out and start stenciling cans that are serviceable. If there's a can that's not serviceable, um, you're probably going to see a red dot on the inside of the lid. And that'll just tell our folks that, okay, we've looked at this, it's not serviceable. We're going to put a flyer in that toter that says, this is not serviceable and here's why. So residents should know what is and is not serviceable well in advance of when the fees go into effect. Um, what we're looking at on the schedule, uh, because that's probably a question that somebody has somewhere. Um, we're looking at putting out a flyer with uh, Q&As, and we're working on the flyer. This is what it looks like right now. We're still in revision stage. Oh, it's um, front and back. Yeah. It's yeah. like a yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this, um, we're going through all the staff with this and making sure that everybody that can think of a question has the question on here. Um, we're going to put this in the utility bill in June. Um, and then in October, the fee will start. So by that time, we hope to have all the toters uh, out to residents. Um, we hope to be able to have all the glitches worked out so that there's no fee being charged before there's, there are toters in place and so forth. We want to make sure that everything's running as it should before we throw that fee out there in October. Okay. One more thought. Um, for example, myself, I went out last year and bought a Hundred dollar toter, um, sixty four gallon, which barely is enough for a family of two. At some times, I have to <coughs> push the lid down really hard. So for somebody like me, that's you know going to be paying this thirty dollars a month and would like a no, larger a larger trash can versus having to pay an extra fee for a second trash can. Are you guys going to accommodate those? Because I don't need it anymore. Probably there's probably going to be other people in the same situation. And there might be families that could use a one-year-old, you know, toter. I if, mean, is the town going to do anything like that? If you'd like to donate it to somebody, that's certainly your prerogative. Um, we are going to give you a 96-gallon toter to begin your service, your new service. <laughs> so if you'd like to donate that toter to someone, uh, please do do so very quickly so that we can get it marked for whoever um, whoever you donate it to. Okay. I have a family with twins that can use it. <laughs> A lot of diverse, a lot of trash. Yes, Mr. Uh, we talked about schedule as far as the fee to start in October. Uh, if approved to do the ARPA funds, when do we expect the new toters to be here for everyone? Um, as soon as you uh, vote on and approve the funds to be transferred, um, as soon as finance gets them transferred, we can get a PO ready. The vendor is ready to go. We have the, um, the stamp. In. Um, the stamp is approved. We've already approved the artwork. Um, so as soon as I get the go-ahead from Lisa that there's a PO ready, the guy is waiting on the phone for my order. 
Um, once he gets the order, it'll be four to five weeks. Do they stamp them there? Yes, ma'am. Oh, so they'll be nice and straight. Yes, ma'am. They will be double stamped with the town logo, um, and it'll say Colonial Beach Public Works on the bottom, kind of like the, the logos, exactly like the logos on our trucks. Mm -hmm. um, and it'll be on either side of the can, so you'll have it on both sides. The cans will be, um, maybe I shouldn't say this, because this will probably get the most fuss out of every out of anything. Uh, the cans will be blue, uh, Colonial <laughs> Beach blue, with the yellow lid, and that was Bill's request. You are going to get some fun out of that. You know how bright and they're like a muted. They're like a muted. They're not a with a bright yellow top. That was Bill's request. I had to give it to him. I don't. And we can still change that. I mean, yeah, haven't ordered that, but I think, I think we'll, we'll work internally on colors. Um, there's we, no unilateral decision made, but we can we can definitely take any feedback that you want. We can. Yeah, the we can. neutral that will blend into the environment are going to be better than something that's going to stand there like a sore thumb. Gray. <laughs> well, and the reason the blue he, top. the reason he didn't yeah. want it to blend in was because they didn't want to miss them. He said a lot of the ones that are. I know Bill. He doesn't miss <laughs> They're black now. And we we can work on colors. The colors are not set in stone, so we can we can definitely work on colors. There's a wide array. That would be a big mistake. Yeah. <laughs> we can work on the colors. I'll right, tell Bill, and I'll please let me know what you'd like. Gray with the plenty of beach blue exactly. top. Gray. Okay. I'm just thinking, Basically. I'm putting them out there. I'm just telling you, I have feedback about this. And, yeah. okay. and, and I, that I prefaced it by saying this will get the most. Fun. I'm glad you said something. Diane, what are the color options? Um, there's a great array of color options. Right? Blue, blue, gray, black. blue, black. Well, council like to go over the color tonight so that we can bring back what you all actually would like. I, I right now have a gray can with the blue top. It's, I heard you Do you have a picture that. of it? The colors, not, All right. not, not with. Me. Bring us back color options at the next meeting. Okay, and then we'll, and that. then we'll put it on your our returns. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I just one concern I'd like to bring up. Um, I know we said we we're going to pay this back, but I'm just concerned how we're spending this ARPA funds. This one-time deal, we're not getting any more of these, and you know, we keep spending. I know we said we're going to send, you know, pay this back, but I mean that may or may not happen. But, I personally would like to see um, like a report from finance um, at a future council meeting of all the ARPA fund expenditures and where we're sitting at. Because we keep bringing this into our meetings. Okay, let's buy some mulch with it. Let's pay the golf cart path. Let's buy trash cans. And me as a council member, I don't really know where this money is. I don't know how much is in the account. I just, I just like to see a, a report in the future. Personally. So we will be bringing that back at our next quarterly report. Um, we do have a, a current number, but obviously, as we are working continuously with New Barry on this uh, central drainage area, we want to make sure we bring you the most up to date number with accurate um, invoices that have been um, paid. So we will do that on the 19th. Yes. Just have a quick question because it is four or five weeks before we would actually get to totals. Do we want to? Take a look at the colors and just go ahead and vote on the color. I mean, I'm agnostic, you know, black, gray. I, I don't have the brochure so, with okay. me tonight. I can send it to you all, um, and it does have the color options on it. Mm -hmm. or, so, or once you, um, you know, you're going to vote on the transfer of money at the next meeting. Yeah, I, I got you. Yeah, I'm the next meeting, you'll bring us color. We can put it in the, in the packet. And then you can have it, a, you know, a day or two ahead. Or I'm just throwing out the the gray with the blue top. Is that whatever you want? Like. Suggestions. Other people have suggestions. Please, by all means, whatever you yes. want. Like. <laughs> um, I, I had I had an interesting question from a, a citizen um, who lives in a town where they have this great big trash truck, and one person drives it, and he never has to get out of the truck. He just somehow or the other drives by and picks up a toter and dumps it. That's not exactly what we're doing, is it? Could you explain? We still have a three-man crew. And, we do. We and do. how it will work. Um, we have what, what's called a rear, a rear arm loader. So in some towns, um, they have a side arm loader. The side arm loader is what you, is what you see, the one 
um, the one-man crew or the one-person crew doing. Um, we do not have that capability. We still have to have the guys get off the truck, pull the toters to the truck, and, and put it in the apparatus, and then pull the lever, and it dumps the toter. So, yes, we, we do still need the three-man crew. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions on this? Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the council. Um, as the council is aware, there appears to be an increasing number of short-term rentals or STRs in the community. Um, right now, there's no regulation for STRs except for uh, the requirement to have a business license. Staff has studied uh, the STR issue uh, to give the council some context and perspective of how other communities are, are addressing uh, short-term rentals uh, uh, to give the, uh, to enable the, uh, the council to decide if and how it may wish to manage uh, short-term rentals in the, in the future. Uh, Darla Odom, uh, who's our town staff contractor with the Berkeley Group, um, has some uh, quite a bit of experience um, addressing uh, short-term rentals and helped uh, actually write the short-term rental ordinance um, in the uh, County of Essex. And she's here tonight to uh, provide a presentation to the council to uh, consider in your deliberation on this issue. So with that, I'll turn it over to Darla. All right. Madam Mayor, council members, Mr. Mrs. Adams Jacobs, I'm Darla Odom, I'm the zoning administrator with the town. Um, and wanted to give you sort of an update and I'll skip over some of the parts because I think Don gave you a good summary. But basically, um, you know, if you put the next slide, please. You know, at coming to Colonial Beach, and I was here, you know, last year in the end of the summer and in the fall, and then saw a slowdown kind of during the colder months. But last week and this week, it's been fun to me to watch you know, things to start to pick up and see a lot of bustling around. And, and I think that's great. And I know that with the tourists that you all have in the town, um, there is a demand for a visitor accommodations. And we believe that that has resulted in now and will in the future result, result in an increase in short-term rentals in the town. Um, at the present, uh, there are 26 known and active short-term rentals operating independently or through online booking engines. A quick search, which you can do online anytime through um, VRBO, Airbnb, looks like there's the number is probably really closer to maybe reaching up to 100 short-term rentals. Um, and so we did that from a staff standpoint. Um, so that's where you are, and we think that, you know, next slide, please. If you are, the well, the slide, if you look at short-term rentals when they first started in Virginia, you know, localities were concerned that there were no, there were no ability for the locality to charge a tax for the short-term rentals. They weren't paying the same lodging taxes as hotels and motels and that kind of thing. So in 2017, the first line of that slide says state code. So the state code was uh, gave localities taxing authority in 2017. And once they had taxing authority, localities found that the exact number of operators was difficult to determine as many book through third party companies. And those third party companies are not allowed to provide, are not required to provide a comprehensive list of the properties that they work with. They are required to pay the taxes, but they're not required to um, keep a list. So the state legislature in 2017 adopted legislation 15.2-983 that allows localities to um, adopt an ordinance which will allow the creation of an annual registry for short-term rentals in the locality. It allows the locality to charge a fee for that registration. It also allows um, corresponding regulations to be adopted and also enforcement action to be put in place in an ordinance <coughs> adopted by the town to help identify the short-term rentals 
And um, so that's there. A lot of localities have taken advantage of it. As Don said, we, we looked at um, some different localities. I actually worked in some different localities that have adopted the ordinance, the most recent being Essex County. But, you know, you have everything from Virginia Beach, which you can imagine. You know, there are short-term rental overlay districts and other processes if you're in other areas and that kind of thing. And that's not something that we would think would be appropriate to bring forward in the town. Um, so that's why, as a model, we were looking at the Essex ordinance. Right now in your town code, you know, a short-term rental is required to have a town business license. And there's a definition that was added to the zoning ordinance. But those are, there are no other regulations. I would say to you that relative to state code, some of you may have known her, and I know um, Dr. Karen Sullivan had, did hear this, and that is that in the 2003, 23, excuse me, legislative session, there were two bills, one in the House and one in the Senate, that were introduced, and the bills were to trying to exempt short-term rental properties managed by licensed Virginia realtors from having to register and be part of the short-term rental registration. There were a few other components of that, um, but that those two bills were tabled in both the House and the Senate committees, and they have asked for the Virginia Housing Commission to study short-term rentals, registrations, and that and bring any information they have back to the 2024 session. Next slide, please. So the issue I see for the town is that, as with other localities, you, you don't know what the exact number of short-term rentals are that you have. You know of the ones that are actually getting the business license and doing that, um, but there may be others that we're not accounting for, and like I said, that quick glance suggests that that's a true statement. The other thing is that um, because of not knowing how many units there are, there is the potential for missed revenue to the town that should be coming in through the business license and uh, paying those taxes. And then three, there's a lack of consistent operations. And with that, to me, that equals the potential for area impacts. So that's one of the reasons why you see localities, and again, they range in regulation from how you know much regulation is put in there to the least amount of reg regulation. But the purpose of that is to try to create a consistency relative to the potential impact that these uses may have on surrounding properties. And not to say that they're negative, but really it's accountability for the operators of the short-term rentals, um, just like with most regulations. It's not the ones that follow the rules and do things the way they should, it's the ones that you have to get in and say, look, you know, we need you to be accountable to your neighbors in this situation. So next slide, please. So again, the most simple and straightforward ordinance that I'm aware of is the Essex County Ordinance. And you guys have been provided a copy of that with your packet. It was an attachments A and B. Um, and those ordinances establish an annual registration form and also a process. So that's the part that I worked with them in the fall when they first adopted the their revised zoning and subdivision ordinance, they included short-term rentals and some regulation on that. And so I worked with them on establishing a process to how a person registers, what the form is. Um, they included an agreement by the short-term rental owner as a signed agreement saying they understood what the requirements were. And then they also included penalty for non-compliance. And their um, ordinance also, um, in the regulations, you don't have some things like you see in some ordinances that are very technical and whatever. But what they do is they are intended to address rental documentation, signage, no signage is allowed in Essex, and safety regulations. 
relative to occupancy based on building code, you know, those kinds of things. Next slide, please. So staff is um, asking for council to direct staff and the Planning Commission to develop an ordinance based on the Essex model. As again, based on that as a starting point. And this would require short-term rental registration and establish the process for that, as well as adopt regulations and a penalty on what that penalty might be if people do not comply with those regulations and registration standards. We feel like that this would establish a new revenue source which would be created uh, for the town's general fund, you know, based on if you did an annual $50 registration fee, which is in the Essex ordinance, then you would end up, if there are 26 short-term rentals now, then that would be about $1,300 generated. Um, if there's 100, you know, that's up to 5,000. So I think that's a process that you could implement and again, giving feedback from the community, economic development, and you all, of course, on what would be appropriate here in the town. The second thing is that if you're able to identify and monitor short-term rentals, then that would assist with your tax revenue. And also, um, if you can act in zoning regulations that are permitted by state code, that will help with consistency as the number may increase and people want to uh, have this use in the town. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, Dr. Okay. Sal Sullivan. Um, first question is, do you have any other examples of smaller towns that could be considered besides the Essex one for comparison? We looked at Irvington, which they have, um, I mean, it's just a, I just need to know if you have other examples. Yes, I mean, yes, yes Could yes, they all be shared with the planning commission instead of just giving them one, say, model it after this? Yes, ma'am. The other question is, I think Mr. Dooley can answer. I understand the planning commission has committees and that um, they can bring in people that aren't on the planning commission to work on certain projects. Is it possible to invite representatives from the um, Economic Development Committee and some of the, the um, residents in town that have short-term rentals to participate in such a committee? Sure, I, have, I see no reason why not, no. I mean, it's their decision, of yes. course, but that's just yes, we a can suggestion to, to use that committee yeah. um, organizational structure that they've set up to invite others that have some experience in this area to participate. No, I think that's a. I think it's a very good idea. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Allison. It's like you knew I had a question. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so knowing that we, when we develop a process like this and we start charging fees, um, who within staff is going to manage the registration of this? Because that's going to take time away from other duties potentially, or we hiring someone to handle this specifically, or is it? Case by case basis to see if it takes a long time to keep this registration up. So I think the goal would be to have an automated process, much like we did with our business licenses that are online now. So I don't anticipate any additional staff needed for potentially a hundred registrations. Okay. Well, my next question was: Is we're going to identify on our town website a link to do that? So you you answer that question. Yeah. Well, we would have to set it up. Understood. Assuming Understood. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Mr. Williams. Um, yeah, just a couple questions. Um, one of the questions was parking. I do see something here that says off street parking. I haven't gone through all this yet, but is that something that we would address? Because I know, for example, I've got one near me that they park in the local park when their guests come because they don't have enough parking. Mm -hmm. Would we enforce? business Airbnbs to have enough parking potentially? Well, you know, that's just something that in Essex County it's much different because, you know, not having the majority of that county being, you know, situated the same as you are exactly. They are on the river, but, you know, so there's a, some 
we would need to look at parking, yes. And that would be something to me that would be unique to Colonial Beach that wouldn't be the exact model of Essex, but yes. And also, there, there are business, I'm not sure, I haven't looked through all this yet, but um, we're requiring to get a business license, so basically we're, we're calling them business. In our trash ordinance, we're requiring them to pay the business fee, which is a little bit higher. Um, so to me, it's a business. And, you know, I've got three popped up behind me, you know, in two years. So um, would there be any, is there anything in this ordinance where it, would we consider it being more of a, treated like a business when it comes to, um, say, say three, one, three neighbors in a row want to have Airbnbs. Um, so we require them to go through the permitting process like, um, like I know some some towns do, where they, they have to have public hearings and um, you know get approved for zoning because they're a business and not a neighborhood house. So is that anything any of that considered in the Essex um, version? Um, no, and if you look at you know one of the issues you know with. It's not to say it's an issue, it's not really an issue, but no, in Essex County, they're permitted by right anywhere that a structure, in, in Essex County, it's a single family dwelling. It, can't be in, it cannot be in other types of structures. Um, so if it is a single family dwelling, then a short term, it could be rented, all or part of it could be rented for short term rental, provided that they register under whatever requirements that the county has for their registration annually. But there's no um, requirement for additional zoning. If you look at the state code, it you know basically it says you can have short-term rentals, and it provides a definition of what they are, and it speaks about um, having the ability to adopt regulations that are reasonable relative to that use. So we wouldn't be looking at I don't think, but again your direction. The model that we'd be using for Essex would not suggest that you would need, for instance, a conditional use or something like that to have the use. Okay. It's kind of the, it's kind of the same vein that somebody would come in that was that had a home occupation. They they would get a, a home occupation permit. It's all it's a ministerial um, type of application. You have certain standards. You comply with the standards. You get your you get your home occupation permit. Okay, Mr. Wood. Yeah, my question is one of compliance because obviously these municipalities have people who don't want to report, right? Um, so how did Essex overcome that problem? So initially they started out to advise everyone that starting at some date, and it was three months out, basically it's a starting at this, they put notices online, they sent notices in, in their um, water bills and to let people know and I think they actually use tax bills too because they don't have water everywhere and they let people know that this is coming and this is what you need to do. Um, they had the registration forms uh, online and since then they have had, I talked to them today, I think I forgot the numbers so don't hold me to the numbers but there was a certain number of people that said oh okay I'm, I have not short-term rentals, so I'm coming in, I'm registering. They had some that said, mm, I'm not really going to do this anymore. And then they had, because everyone knew about this process and what it meant, um, they had got some complaints about people that were operating short-term rentals in manufactured homes. So those are the ones that they had to go to enforce because in their ordinance, you, know, you can't have it at a manufactured home. Some of them, I think, were travel trailers. Um, so that was the issue there. Um, so it was a, based on complaints. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, hold on, I want a chance to catch up to before we get. Um, I had some similar questions about enforcement, but I would echo Karen's suggestion that this continue to go through the planning commission process and engage the EDC um, as a joint effort, because what I would hate to do is the planning commission go all the way through that, then the ADC gets it, then it's got to go back to the planning commission, then it's got to go back to the ADC. Let's just have the two, those two groups, which I think have vested interest in this, 
to work together. Um, I thought the, the Essex example was spot on in a lot of ways. So I don't, I didn't see a lot of variance need. I thought that it's addressing a lot of these things. The one thing that I would say is to align it with the business license timing so that you submit both forms at the same time period so that it's more convenient and the, you know, because it's sort of added privacy to it. I will tell you that I have a very big concern about the uh, lack of the lodging industry contributing to um, the uh, revenues here in town. Um, the lodging industry numbers used to be a lot higher for the town of Cleveland Beach. We know there are not less people here now than there were then, and yet the lodging revenues are um, significantly less, which tells me that the lodging industry is been affected severely by Airbnb, VRBO, short-term rentals, and people are not compliant. One of my biggest concerns, though, is that we implemented the business license procedure a year ago. We've been pretty flexible about that business license procedure as it rolled out. Nice to people who didn't know about it. Okay, that's okay. Just come over and get your business license, you know? Um, and yet, we're still seeing 75% possibly of people not complying. So, the um, I feel one of the biggest things that I like about the application of the process in here was that the zoning gives us a mechanism for penalty. I hard to be that hard about it, but the reality is, this is a part of our lodging industry, and it's a burden to some of our other lodging businesses. And so they need to be also equitably taxed, I think, and contributing to that. And there's sometimes a nuisance effect. And so what about? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I believe the state defines short term rental for the purpose of paying um, lodging tax at 90 days. And I believe our ordinance, our, uh, we, we, we define it as 30 days. Anything less than 30 days, you have to pay the local tax in addition to the state tax. What does Essex, how does Essex define it? Essex's definition is very, it's the same as with the town's ordinance that was proposed for the definition, and that came from the state definition. So theirs is 30 days or theirs is They're 90 days? 30. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Because it, it really, the, the rental period of less than fewer days is has to do with, I guess, occupying a residence. I think that there's, they split that within less than 30 days, I mean it's temporary occupancy. If you start to go over that 30 days, then it's more considered more yeah. permanent. The state of Virginia still charges a sales tax, though, if it's less than 90 days. And that's great information for us to, to have as we're working through this. So I don't know where that difference came in. Um, I think, for me, I think 30 days, I think I think adding, they're already paying a 5% tax, like you're coming here for three months to work or, or study or whatever, they're already paying that. I don't think, uh, personally, and I don't have short-term rentals anymore, but that another local tax on top of that is, is just an extra burden for somebody that's really going to be a member of the community. Yeah, no, I wouldn't recommend changing that. Yes, Mr. Williams? Uh, just one last question. Do we have any idea of how many Airbnbs are actually paying the lodging tax? Okay. They still have the business licenses, but surely um, Airbnb companies collect that money even if the person is not business license, but they still come here. Correct. Right. So we, it, as far as I know, yes. Right. I'm not 100% sure right. on that, but yes, they do have to collect it and it is paid. But it's collected as a lump sum. They send any, anything that they collect tax on for the town of Colonial Beach, they send a dollar amount. They don't break it down into how many properties, <coughs> what those properties are. Do you think finance is working on that, though? Do you have an idea how much it is that we're bringing in from lodging taxes? I would have to defer to Adam on that. He may have to bring that back at our um, financial report next. I next have to defer, but I will have to bring it back. Okay, thank you.
Uh, I'd like to pass this back to the planning commission with some of this direction, and we can still get the answer to those questions. And, you know, when as the finance report. Yes, ma'am. Um, I don't want to hold it up here at council level. Let them. They obviously both the commission and the EBC. You know, have had to look at it and have comments. So. Is there a consensus in that direction? All right. Um, yeah. Can I just point out just a point of clarification um, that both some of the research that um, Darla has done, as well as the ordinance that Essex has passed, has been worked on by both the working group and Sands Anderson. So, as a matter of having subject matter experts having looked at this, um, I just want to put that out there um, that in some instances, looking at the Essex model that has been presented um, is something that we brought um, forward because we did believe that it aligned and it would not require a lot of modifications and a lot of times. And this was something that was brought up back in 2021 and more of a delay will only further I think some of the proliferation. So just wanted to put that out there before we go encouraging rewriting of things that have been reframed by actual subject matter experts. I still wanted to go to the planning commission with ADC's involvement and Ms. Odom can present to them and explain all her expertise and involved in the matter. Yes, yes ma'am. I'd like the citizens to have some say in it too, not just the economic development. In terms of definitely value, but I've heard door knocking the last couple of years, I've heard a lot of people with complaints about Airbnbs or comments, so I think that they should definitely have a seat at the table. Will you help us by encouraging people to get involved at the Planning Commission um, dialogue? It's better if that yeah. comment is involved in the, um, I think, in that process before it gets to some final thing that there's an expectation of approval. I'm guessing that's where it would be anyway, right? The Planning Commission would yes, sir. invite public comment on it. So, okay, yeah, definitely encourage that. Thank you. All right. Town Hall HR. The uh, town manager mentioned maybe giving a deadline to the planning commission to get this back to you. Two months. Yes, well, I will. I will. I will bring it up. We have a work plan, so I don't know. We'll we'll bring that up to the uh, to the planning commission of the next meeting next week to uh, mm -hmm. schedule uh, our work plan, so we can bring it back to you as soon as possible within the next two or three months. I think if this is a very good framework, yeah. maybe the comments, would, you know, or changes would be limited, and that's suggested too. We're not looking for a rewrite; we're looking for it to vote down. Correct. Okay. Did you, Mr. Dooley, did you say two or three months? I think we can. I think we can reasonably bring it back to you within 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 sixty days, plus or minus. Okay. Now we're to back. And do we have a presentation? There we go. Okay. Next slide, please. We need a whole presentation on it. We know it's broke. Have you been in town hall? Has anybody out there been in town it, hall? It's very short. Yes. Yeah. It's like when it's hot or cold that time. Were you sweating or were you freezing? I'm just answering your first question. I've been in town hall. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's very short. Okay. Okay, so the summary of this, um, the mayor just told you it's, it's broke. Um, this is a picture of our boiler. Um, Back, back, not that fast. Uh, the boiler is old. It's obsolete. When we call people, they can't find parts. When they do find parts, they're at uh, premium prices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The old uh, electric heaters, wall heaters, have been brought back into service. Um, when the boiler can't be run, but I'm not comfortable with that um, solution either. Next slide. Um, the pneumatic thermostat controls are no longer functional. What that means is that a rubber hose with a vacuum um, controls these thermostats. As you can imagine, the rubber hoses are 50 years old. Um, they're falling apart. They're falling apart behind the walls. So uh, the recirculation pump on the boiler, just from the time I started this presentation to tonight, has locked up. And Heather's really hurrying me through this. <laughs> <laughs> so without a recirculation pump, the boiler is essentially unusable. Um, the, the pneumatic thermostats are, are obsolete. 
um, an option would be to put in digital controlling, but that's no longer an option as stated on your memo because the boiler is now unusable. Next slide. Cooling of the building is done through these various older window shakers. Next slide. <laughs> Um, the alternatives are to replace the current archaic systems with mini split units, um, and the staff recommends um, that no other reasonable options are available as the ductwork and the other infrastructure in Town Hall is at least 70 years old. Next slide. Um, again, the mini splits, some of the benefits would be that we could zone various areas as shown there, increasing the efficiency and the worker comfort. No ductwork uh, would be required for these and they'd be able to be removed and reinstalled in another facility at a, co at a current cost of $2,000 per unit. Next slide. What I'm asking for is a total of five mini split units for Town Hall for right now that would uh, cover heating and cooling. Uh, each unit installed is around $10,000 and a total of five would be 50,000 installed. Next slide. That's it, see? <laughs> Questions? I have one question. Is the electrical there going to support all of these mini splits and does that have to be an upgrade to the service? Yes, ma'am. We had that checked um, and we're pulling, we're pulling, uh, keep in mind, we're pulling off the old window shakers, we're pulling off the boiler, we're pulling off the old electrical heaters. So we have had quality, uh, one of the uh, contractors that we work with um, assess town halls heating and or the electrical and we are able to install the five mini splits at current levels, yes. Okay, and my second question, and this is maybe not a necessary question, but I'm not sure. Did you look into PTAC units, which look like an air conditioner unit, but sit in the window and do both heat and electric? Um, we did not. Uh, we can. That is kind of, a, I mean, the mini split is kind of a mini um, heat pump system. Okay, so uh, PTAC the is the same thing. It's an mm -hmm. all-inclusive unit, but there's no outdoor now a uh, uh, compressor uh, unit. And they're about a quarter of the cost. We can start looking okay into them. I just think, you know, for the age of the building, we understand what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. It's about a P -tap. Happy to. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to kind of follow up and uh, say that the mayor's idea might be a good one because we don't really know what we're going to find if we start ripping things off the walls there, right? My, my biggest concern about, and the reason why I asked the electrical question is that the PTEC units plug into a, a regular outlet, mm -hmm. but I know that the outlets already have breakage issues, Correct. so Correct. You, they may need to be hardwired. Hard -wired. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? I, I can, you would I, generally put like a designated outlet for it if you mm -hmm. were concerned about that kind of thing in an older building, but uh, these PTEC units are another option on this older infrastructure issues. I can check into that. Okay. Yeah. Have we actually had a contractor come out and give us a bid, like a writing bid? We have two bids, yes, sir. And this was the lowest. Okay. Thank you. I want to do, I'm on board for doing something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So just to make that clear. Okay. Yes, Dr. Sussman. Do any of the contractors that you're currently dealing with use these units that Robin is describing? Um, I'm not aware of that unit, so I'm going to learn, okay. um, but I, I'm, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they know. I'm a little um, put out that they didn't recommend them, so I'm, I'm going to learn about them and ask for those prices. I can give you some examples, and there are some in Colonia Beach, too, that you can go see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The main part is that they still looks like a window AC unit, so a lot of homeowners don't want to use them because Okay. Hmm. So that's what hotels usually. Correct. It's okay. exactly like what a hotel. Okay. Has. I gotcha. Yeah. Stay works all the time. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, they're pretty standard. Okay. So you're gonna bring that back and then we'll vote on the money at the next meeting. Sure. Okay. Consensus? Yes. Yes. Have we identified a funding source for this? Sorry, have we identified a funding source for this? Or, or will you bring it to the next meeting? Uh, 
Yes, we can identify a funding source. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Beach report. Okay, while she's finding that, <clears throat> I um, what this report will show you is just at the town beaches are in dire need of refurbishment. We do have a report from BIMS, uh, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, that assesses our beach conditions, and basically they are um, they are saying what we're saying in the report tonight. Next slide, please. So these are just some photos for you. Um, Irving Beach in 1995 and Irving Beach today. I just thought pictures are worth a thousand words. Next slide. This is South Beach, again, 2007 and today. Next slide, please. Um, this is a summary of the Vins Beach Assessment Report. Basically, it just says that the survey shows that the Central <coughs> Beach has lost about 5,000 cubic yards of sand between 2016 and 2022. Um, it talk, talks about the breakwaters there. Uh, the bottom part talks about the storm recreation and recreational use that the town relies on and the continued erosion if we do not do anything. Um, it also talks about sea level rise, which has come back up about two thirds of a foot or eight inches since the um, breakwaters were installed. The breakwaters were installed in 1982 by the Army Corps of Engineers, from what I understand. And um, we're looking at possibly adding, uh, just as they indicate here, we're looking at possibly adding a layer of armor stone um, to raise the breakwaters for the time being. Next slide. So the background is, again, that the public beaches are why people come to Colonial Beach. Um, the replenishment has never really been done on any large scale. There has been some uh, replenishment done in the 90s, from what I understand, that was a little bit more than what we do currently. Um, I'm sure some of you will have more historic knowledge on that than I will. In the past 10 years, the maximum sand um, that was done on beaches at any one time um, was 900 tons, which you'll see in a little bit is, is uh, not, not a lot. Um, each year we do a little bit of refurbishment, but nothing has ever been gone out. Nothing has ever been done to go back out to the breakers and connect them. Um, there's a link there that you might find interesting, and it talks about the uh, Mid-Atlantic region naturally sinking, besides the fact that we also have sea level rise. <coughs> nice. Okay, so the alternatives are to do nothing, and then again, the beaches will continue to erode and eventually reaching Irving Avenue and the homes and businesses. Uh, we can continue to replenish in the small areas like we do now. Next slide, please. The fiscal impact to do the entire um, cost for now um, to upgrade the breakers, um, we're looking at raising them three feet in height and widening them um, three feet by six feet, basically, <coughs> on top of what's already there for, for each breaker. And then we're looking at uh, calculations here that take the sand back out to the breakwaters and widen those uh, beaches out a little bit at the breakers. So that's broken out there for you. You can see Irving Beach with the four jetties, South Beach Town portion of Castlewood, and then Boardwalk Beach, which is the middle, which has no jetties. You can see the amount, the tons of sand that are estimated to be needed. Um, the riprap is, of course, the six inches or six six feet wide. That should be six feet. Is that six feet? Six feet wide um, by basically a hundred feet long and then three feet high for each jetty. Um, the vegetation. If you look at some of the the jetties or the breakwaters on Castlewood Beach, you'll see, of course, the fried mighties, which we don't want to promote because it's invasive, but you'll see that it does do a job of retaining those beaches out to the breakwaters. Um, there is also some natural vegetation in trees and some other natural or native vegetation on the Castlewood um, breakwater south of the one where the Fragmites is that's also retained 
to the breakwater because of vegetation and roots and, and so forth. So we're recommending when we do rebuild these um, that we do plant native materials um, at the breakwaters to help that retention if we're going to put that amount of effort into it. So that's why the vegetation is in there. That's an estimate. Um, of course, we can probably look for grants for some of this. You'll see also we have some equipment that we can use, but we also need additional equipment rentals. This is doing a, a lot of the work in-house with rented equipment, and you see there an estimate for all of it uh, at 300000 um, 300,000 and up. Um, the only other thing on this slide I want to make a point of mentioning is that this is, again, a one-time replenishment recommendation. It should occur periodically. This does not replace the need for the annual monies to be assigned when we go in and, and uh, do the $50,000, bring in sand and refurbish the beaches after each season. That is still needed. This is on top of that annual refurbishment. Next slide. This is just to give you an idea of what one ton, one ton of sand would cover. Um, three feet by two feet by four feet. That's it. That's all you get. Next slide, please. And the recommendation is to approve at this time um, 75000 which is in the erosion fund, to apply for restoration. And then we have put the additional monies in the CIP schedule for FYs 24, 25, and 26. Um, those numbers are 150, 150, and 50, respectively. <coughs> Next slide, please. That's it. Questions? And I'm happy to, um, the VIMS report is only this long, that's a lot of pictures, but I'm happy to, uh, India has the, um, the link if any of you would like to look at the Please send it. The beach report. Please okay. send it out. Will do. Okay. You, um, Lisa, you want to just uh, clarify for anybody who's wondering what the beach replenishment fund is? That's a separate fund, not our general fund. That was like a savings account kind of. There is an erosion fund um, that we have um, that was left over from, I don't even know what year, um, when the Army Corps of Engineers had come out and uh, helped us re, uh, replenish the beach at one point. Um, this money's been there since I've been here. It's, it's the fund's older than the 11 years I've been here. Um, and we've never done anything with it, never used it. Each year we do, we have put money in the budget under building grounds to do a beach uh, replenishment. Um, but like she said, it's very minimal amount of money and it's just a very short, small amount of replenishment. Um, we've never addressed, since I've been here, the erosion that's happening and how much the shoreline has changed in the last 11 years. And again, that, that erosion one's never been ever funded. Um, that, that money's just been sitting there from the last time this big major undertaking was, hap was happening. Okay. Uh, I saw Mr. Wood first, then I'll get to you, Mr. Wood. Uh, Ms. Byers, uh, this is basically triage for a season to $75,000, right? Um, this is basically triage as far as we can make the money go. Right. Um, I would estimate that we could maybe do um, one of the lesser affected breakwaters mm -hmm. and beaches, um, maybe a second one, but it, it, it will go as far as it will go. Where do you anticipate the, the, the one that we can do? The one that we can do, I would say we should address one of the ones on Irving Beach because that seems to be the one um, that gets the most traffic. Um, so I would say one of the lesser affected uh, breakwaters on Irving, along the Irving Beach section. Okay, and just a, as a question, why would we, is it because of the money that, that we have to, we can only work on the, the lesser affected beaches, is that it? You mean with the 75,000? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, only because that money is available now right. versus, versus uh, needing it to come to us in the CIP of, for 24. Understood, but my, my question is as far as which beach 
-hmm. that we're going to spend the money on, why we're we going to move to one of the lesser affected regions? Because seventy-five thousand isn't going to do one of the okay. worst affected. Gotcha. Worst gotcha. sir, is that worse? That's not worse. Yeah. One, yeah. one of the more worse. This is Long Beach. Yeah. Just like ain't got none. Right? <laughs> the the last question I have for you. I know that uh, we're presently working, and there's no guarantee, but uh, we are working with the Baltimore Corps of Engineers to hopefully come up with a a better solution ultimately. We are, but I would not count on that being. Um, being your saving grace for these beaches. I would say, um, just my opinion, that we ought to be looking for grants and and other funding. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers, in my, in my experience, they take a long time mm -hmm. to decide on money, and sometimes even when they do decide on the money, they'll pull it from you and apply it to something that may have come in that fits their uh, strategic plan a little better than something they may have had at the time they told you they would give you the money. Thank you. Just to add on that, Councilman Wood, uh, we are working with the Army Corps, but exclusively on the North Beach area at this point. Um, historically, the Army Corps has come in about 30 years ago on the South Beach, and they have indicated that based on their work at the time, it's held up as they expected. Um, but that was, again, about 30 years ago. So I just want to be clear that we are working with the North, North Beach. Um, but not any other areas at the time. Yeah, that's right. I'm just curious, is, is that sand, like the work, the ugly orange sand that I hear a lot of people complain about? Or, um, know, it, is, price? it is what we call B sand, and in the VIMS report you will see that they recommend using native sand, which is what we bring in, which is the B sand. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Not I orange. I heard sand. we had white sand here at one time. But, uh, I heard that too, but I think it's a little when, exaggerated. I think when there were more oysters, maybe. It was like 100 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't here then. <laughs> and also, you said something about three foot jennies. Are you talking about expanding up three feet above where it already is? The breakwaters, we are looking at um, raising them three feet and three feet by six feet. So some of those jennies are probably 10, 12, 15 feet wide. Uh, we're not looking at doing the entire width. We're just looking at trying to get some some uh, height to keep those those waves from overtopping. Which um, at this point, if you go out there on a on a day with a good high tide and some wind, some of those breakwaters are totally underwater. And like India said, the Army Corps um, says that they have performed as expected, but we have sea level rise and and the area is sinking. So those two factors along with rising storm events and so forth, um, the breakwaters just aren't able to do their jobs like they were designed to 40 years ago. Okay, mm -hmm. Tom, did you have something? Well, if we don't have a beach, we might as well repeal the town of Charter. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I wonder if this we couldn't get qualifies for some state funding in this particular aspect where we wouldn't in some of our other coastal things on the Potomac River because we are also ensuring the square footage of the Commonwealth of Virginia. There you go. Just <laughs> <laughs> say Okay. Um, a couple of years ago, well, more than a couple of years ago, there was complaint about the frame lighties. And the town manager at the time instructed Public Works to go out there and dig them up. Well, you can see how that particular breakwater has eroded even worse. I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that impact and that if you're going to do anything, cut them back. Don't dig them up. <laughs> I have already instructed my staff. Um, that's kind of my bailiwick um, is the native plants and the invasives and the conservation and all that sort of thing. So I've already instructed my staff that we will never do that again. Um, it's like digging up bamboo. Uh, forget it. Um, so we will cut them back. It, last year we didn't get to them in time. There's no point in cutting them back when they get to seed uh, because, again, you're going to make the problem worse. But that horse is out of the barn. We know that we're going to have frag mighties forever and ever and ever. And all we can do is manage it. But yes, I agree with you. And and it's a matter of function. Um, we need the function, we do. even if it would the be better mat. if there was something else the doing mat. that function. Yes, ma'am. The root mat is imperative there. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is 
there anything else? Okay. Senior and Disabled Discount Program. of Social Security income for seniors and disabled. Um, the notice went out in January that their living, their cost of living increase was 8.7% on what they already receive. Um, because of that, I'm concerned about what our threshold, what our qualifications are for the amount. Let's see. So a little background. In September 1996 is when the water sewer discount was established. It was only for water and sewer. Um, for a single person, the income was the income cutoff was 17,500. For a married person, it was 25,000. And the discount only applied to your final bill, your final water and sewer bill in the fiscal year. Um, in 2007, it changed to include the real estate thanks to Virginia. Um, they passed um, a bill that allowed us to have that. Hold on, sorry. <laughs> that allowed us to have that kind of um, authority. Sorry. Um, and also the maximum as asset amount decreased. So before it was $125,000 $125, was allowed for your assets, and it decreased by $25,000. So it was down to $100,000, and your total assets do not include the resident you live, the residence that you reside in. Um, and then the award was set to $100 a year for water and sewer, so that would be $25 bill. And the award for the real estate was set at $300 a year, so that was $150 for each billing. Um, in 2014, they raised the income levels, so it went to $22,500 for single, $32,000 for married, and they upped the water and sewer discount and the real estate discount water and sewer $200, which it currently is now, and $600 for real estate, which is the current. So 2014 was the last time that this was reviewed. Um, so the issues now is Social Security going up. Um, the last time that it was eight point, like in that level of eight point or higher, was back in the 80s, late 70s. Um, and since then, as you can see, it just kind of remained steady. Um, we have a total of 35 homeowners on the approved list, with five of those applicants being married with a joint gross income ranging from 17,462 to 28,208. The remaining 30 homeowners are single with incomes ranging from 8,808 a year up to $22,476 a year. Um, as you can see on this chart, the federal poverty level for a single person is 14,580. We currently have 10 applicants, approved applicants that are under that poverty rate. For two people, it's 19,720 um, for poverty level. And then for the HUD, Virginia, very low income, which is your next step up. For a single person, it's 28,700. And then for married, it's 32,800. And as you can see, this is the married very low income, and then this is the single very low income. So everybody on the approved list is either below poverty level or between poverty and very low income. Um, so I looked and pulled property cards for the 10 that are below the poverty level. And average, their homes are worth $153,350 with our current tax rate, that's giving them $1,196.13 a year that they have to pay in real estate tax. And with the water and sewer and then the trash being included, 
That's an additional $1,340. And currently, they're only getting $900 in tax credits. $800. $800, yes, $800 in tax credits. Sorry, I was keep okay. back in the water and sewer is $300. I know. Um, and so that's the issue before council right now. Um, there's an estimated 84 senior citizens over the age of 65. Um, that are all below the poverty level, but approximately 55 of those are accommodated to manage housing, which means that they are not homeowners. So then there's, a, what is it, 29 people, 29 senior citizens who are homeowners or some other form of living arrangement. So that's the issue. So I think it's time to review it and maybe do some research and analysis to see if we should raise the income threshold and or raise the amount that's awarded. I'm going to piggyback off of Heather's presentation because her and I worked on this last Friday together some. And um, so I'll just kind of tell you my feedback would be is to raise the award thresholds, the thresholds, the income thresholds to the HUD VLI rate, which is that pink and purple line on there. And if we align it with a HUD established rate, then we don't have to revisit the ordinance every year. We just say <laughs> it is the HUD VLI rate. And then as the HUD VLI rate changes with the economy and things like that, then the ordinance is automatically updating itself with that ratio. Um, the other thing was to also uh, add a discount level. That means the uh, water sewer, which is at 200, and the real estate, which is at 600, to up those both by 25% um, consistent with that Social Security raise. Um, but there needs to be a financial impact um, analysis with the budget and what that means because it's about ten thousand dollars in real estate and six thousand dollars in water and sewer to kind of do both of those things so i'm just kind of giving some parameters out there and i think heather's just looking for more feedback so they can do more budget appropriate yeah. a question um and of course we, we don't know what the economic impact would be but is there an appetite for exploring just truly means tested. Right now we're talking about elderly and disabled, right? Um, they're not the only affected community. Um, so I, I would like to put that out there to see if there was, people would be interested in discussion and make that part of the impact study to see uh, what the ramifications were budget wise. So that might, um, and I know I'm gonna defer to uh, Karen on this, <laughs> I was watching a, uh, a Charles County budget meeting in my spare time, and it was riveting. Anyway, it was like an in the weeds budget meeting too. And they were talking about in Charles County how important it is that the locality actually uses their um, housing authority or their nonprofit agencies to run means programs like that, and that the government then does not run the program, but maybe just allocate a stipend to it. So I just say that as a way to get to a means thing, mm -hmm. which could have an actual more concrete financial analysis instead of this like variable we don't know where it's going to target. If our housing authority was capable of running a means program, a means assistance program. I mean, we don't right now fund our housing authority, which to me is a little bit insane. So. You know, if there was a budget request from the housing authority and they wanted to set up a program like this, I don't think it could happen this year. I think it's too short with the budget season, but I don't see anybody here from the housing no. authority. No, and I just keep looking at them because you online. Online. <laughs> you'll communicate with them this concept because um, Judy McGurvin, who is on the housing authority, had reached out to me and said, um, you know, her concerns about some of this, and it just think I think if they have a pulse on the issue, maybe they are also just you know, that's their, would be an avenue for them to, um, and part of their authority. Um, so there are, there are some programs through MAID and that sort of thing. They, 
the the only issue that I have with it, and I agree with you, don't make perfect the enemy of good. You know, how, how would we get from point A to point B? But right now, we don't have anything happening in that regard. So, uh, however, we get past the uh, the stasis of that, um, and maybe it is through the, the housing authority, uh, maybe it is through Bay Aging, maybe it is through us taking a look at uh, means testing. I, under I understand you correctly. You're saying that extend a, a break on taxes and utilities to people that are at this lower level of income, whether or not they have a disability or have reached the required age. Is that, your, Correct. Is that what you're saying? I, I, I would like to at least see what the economic ramifications are. Right. So and one, one question for that is how many of those people, and that's what I was going to ask, how, the, how many of those people are actually homeowners that would qualify anyway? My other thing is, what have you looked at if um, if we went to these levels, how many more people would qualify? Do you have any data to help estimate that? No, I've just been pulling data from um, the census. I'm trying to find the one that has the, because I know according to the census, 279 of the homeowners in Colonial Beach have a gross income of less than $34,999 a year. Um, and that's not based on age. I think with the age thing, the part of our, because she has a lot of census data, but unfortunately you have to triangulate the census data, right? So um, when we look at the number of seniors in poverty level, we have that number, right? And then we look at how many of those seniors in poverty level are probably housed already by the living next to the nursing home. And um, Riverwood also has those first floor, that whole section of housing there. Or even renting from somebody else. Or renting from somebody else. else. Yeah. yeah, we were kind of backed into about 30 residents who I, this, reflects that probably all 30 are getting the program now. So I'm not sure how many more. So if we, if we raise the levels, how many more people would that bring into the program? I don't know that it would be a lot more because the level is still so low. It's still, what's our current, what's the current income level right now in the program? Does it say on here? Because that one's not out there. Oh, it's, um, 22, 500. And 32. And 32. So go back to the other chart. So. So where's 22? This person right here mm -hmm. is like within $30 of being denied. The current. The and then these are like. 32 is like right here. Yeah, so we're only talking about the uh, married one going up by 800 bucks is to meet that HUD threshold. But the single one is the jump from 22 to 28. It's 10 people, right? Yeah. No, it's 10 people, 10, 10 single people under the poverty level. And <coughs> two married couples under the married poverty level. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it seems as though we're, we're talking about potentially different programs. Um, but I, I would hopefully like our team to be able to look at this holistically. Um, and not one particular department in a vacuum so we can ensure that there aren't any long-term um, impacts um, that maybe we aren't projecting and, and possibly work with our advisors to make sure we're looking at the total impact and do some benchmarking analysis to bring back some examples for council. My understanding is you're looking for direction from council to investigate it at this point, right? 
I've never been tasked with this item. The clerk has been taking the lead, but I think that um, to ensure that we are not impacting our public works department, um, as there are programs we are actively working on, that there are no adverse impacts, um, but also that we're looking at this holistically and then collaborating with the housing authority to see their capacity to be able to roll out the program. Because it sounds as though we're talking about a utility relief program, potentially, based on means testing, and then we're still talking about Potential changes to our senior and disabled discount program, which would be separate. I am only talking about the senior and disabled discount program, and that the concept for a means thing, I think it's a totally never, it's too late in the budget process, I think, to tackle that issue. And I'm not saying that it's something that we need to address right away, but you know, the journey of a thousand miles, right? So it's something that we haven't explored before. And, and uh, I think it's worthwhile investigating, especially since we're we're engaging in, in our treasure hunt anyway to see what the economic impacts are. We don't have to act on it until the new fiscal year. But, but what I don't want it. is the us to become more congruent with the current economic levels in the program we currently have to get bogged down and not be able to make those changes for the people that we're already I, I, I think all we need to to um, make a motion to bring our levels in line with the standardized levels so they go up and down automatically is just whatever you think is important as far as an impact on the existing benefits, right? So that would be the handicapped and elderly. If we bring them up, and we could do that for this year's budget, and then we can look into, through the housing authority and other ways of assisting people that aren't handicapped or elderly. As a different, I mean, you know, right. like, yeah. I'm trying to separate those two things. So I'm not saying to not look at them. Um, if there's yes. consensus to look at the, both of them, that's fine, but I am not trying to attach them together because this is still, even to just do this, requires a code update, which is going to take two more months. Okay, just doing this because you come back, you you we have to analyze this for this budget. It has to have red lines. We have to look at that. It has to go to legal. You know what I'm saying? This is already. Is it possible to get it in place for next for this coming fiscal year for July one? I think if we keep the scope very limited, I think we could. Can that be our direction to get it back to us in the form of a ordinance that we can, or a code change that we can look at in in time? Is that a, does it, do other people think that's pertinent? I would be happy to uh, assist in that regard. Right, I, I think giving relief to people who need it is always a worthwhile thing. That's why I brought it up. So I don't want to stop someone else from experiencing the benefit of it by bogging it down. What I don't want to do is have it disappear. You understand right. what I mean? Exactly. That's the distinction. Exactly. So I agree with the mayor, whatever we need to do to get a full speed ahead for those folks in need now that we've identified. But what I would like to see is us make sure <coughs> that there are other people in our community that are suffering as well. And so if we can't fit, help them today, we can help them tomorrow. That's it in a nutshell. Yeah. I think with us being like in the phase of where we're at with the budget process, and plus applications are due by next Friday for the senior citizen disabled discount, so that they will go into effect when the new fiscal year starts. Um, and that's the way it's been for many, many years. So I think just taking our time going through this, making sure that all of the analysis and all the work has been done so that way we can put it in next year's in fiscal is it 25 and fiscal 25's budget and be well i prepared so that way we're not piecing the ordinance that it's completely you know done i wasn't trying to affect this application round okay this application round is already to me that's already so, done yeah. it was about the Next year, mm -hmm. and when we had spoke about this before, it was also that there we were getting really, really close for some of these applications. Was thirty dollars close to the threshold? That if we didn't look at this now, that so quickly it was going to come up upon us that that was not. 
But this year, this year's applicants are still safe. Correct. It's still okay. Correct. So I just want to, yeah, if this isn't looking for this year, right. we're just getting ahead for next year. I just thought that the code needed to change before next year because we're going to go into CIP process and budget. So whatever timeline needs to happen. Also, I'm, you know, this is brought up before as well. So it's been brought up several times. I know. So I <laughs> don't know why any um, any department um, would have to work in a vacuum for it when we brought it up several times. We can work with our, our team um, as we work on our long-term financial planning to bring you back solutions and scenarios um, ahead of um, next year, so making sure that we line up with all of this. So do we anticipate anybody being kicked out of the program this year because their Social Security went up and put them above this level? Okay. I don't. <clears throat> I don't anticipate that. <coughs> okay. So we're going to come back with some options on this. Just this kind of ordinance. Just on the senior and disabled. I just want to clarify adjustments to the income threshold, adjustments to the actual discount, and and then you know, whatever kind of adjustment for this trash fee thing. That's another reason to do this sooner rather than later before that fee starts. <coughs> and, and I would encourage tying it to those fluctuating numbers so we don't have to change it. Right. Okay. okay, is there any other discussion? Anybody else? All right, we get to the point where we get to have a break. Yay, but we still have close meetings. Man, my sunshine went away, didn't it? It's okay. I know. I watched it go down. All right, hold on. Before you break, uh, I got to move. I'm going to make the motion and open meeting, and then we'll take the break. Uh, move the town, town council, town of Plenty Beach, convene a closed meeting for the following purpose and to discuss the following subjects, all of which are exempt by Virginia law by public meeting requirements as indicated. Namely, pursuant to Virginia Code 22.2.2 37 a 3 and 8, discussion and consideration of the disposition of publicly held real property for discussion and open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiation strategy of the town council in consultation with legal counsel regarding the legal. Specific legal matters related thereto, respectively. Pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2.3711A4, protection of the privacy of individuals and personnel matters not related to public business. Pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2.3711A8, consultation with legal counsel regarding the following matter under the provision of legal advice, rescue squad. Pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2.3711A7, consultation with legal counsel pertaining to actual litigation where consulting over meeting would adversely affect the town's litigation posture regarding the town of Clinton Beach First Camp, Westmoreland County Circuit Court. Pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2-3711A3 and 8, respective discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for public purpose. Where discussion over the meeting would adversely affect the town's bargaining position or negotiation strategy and consultation with legal counsel regarding town hall. That's it. Motion? So, Second. Second. All in favor? Uh, All right. Ten minute reset. Yeah. <laughs>